part of the um, by anything in Christian tradition. Um, and it's also the case that I think is the best explanation for um, making sense of the Trinity as a whole. So someone said, how is beauty evidence for God? Yeah, so that's the topic of the live stream today. And I am accepting invites if anybody wants to come up and chat with me about it. So yeah, so I would point out some things like this. First, um, to put this argument kind of in a succinct way, the natural world is filled with objects which strike us as breathtakingly beautiful. However, in our everyday experiences, things usually don't turn out beautiful unless they are the result of artistic intent. And then even then, it's often the case that even with artistic intent, they still fail to turn out beautiful. So if this is the case, then we have thus good grounds for inferring artistic intent um, behind the universe because that is something which the beauty in the universe is to be more expected under the God's existence than it is to be expected if there is no God, if there is no artistic in, uh, intent. So that's kind of the basis of the argument. Now, there's a couple other things I'd point out there. Um, first, we often get a sense of profound... Uh, kind of profoundness when we are experience beauty. There's kind of this intuition that there is something important in and of itself with it. And oftentimes when we experience beauty, there is kind of this longing to, um, in a sense, enter into the beauty, to be kind of wrapped up in it. And I think the best explanation for all of this is that... Um, when we see beauty, especially in nature, we're kind of getting a glimpse of the cosmic artist. I see some people say um, saying that beauty is, a, is subjective. However, I don't think that that's the case. So um, let, let's say you and I went for a walk. Let's say you and I, um, we went into the woods and maybe we hiked, hiked to the top of the mountain, like the one you see in the background there. And let's say we get to the top and it's just sunset. And we're looking down at the valley below, and it's kind of basked in a warm sunlight. And I turn to you, and I say, oh, I say, this is beautiful. You know, I say, this is, this is just sublime. This is incredible. And you turn to me, and you say, ugh, the view of the valley is horrid. It's just ugly. And then you turn to a pile of feces that has, like, maggots crawling in it. And you say, this, this is beautiful. You take out your phone. You take a picture of the feces. You put it as your phone's back uh, backdrop. Let's say you text that to your mom to show her. At that point, I think there is something psychologically wrong with you. At that point, I'm regretting going into the woods alone with you. It seems objectively the case that the view of the valley is more worthy of having beauty attributed to it than it is the pile of feces. And this is something that um, I think is intuitive once we step out of this, oh, beauty is subjective thing that we kind of get into. At least some things seem to be objectively meriting beauty or have beauty. Um, there is a proper response to some things. And we all recognize this because we all argue about this quite regularly. We argue, we get mad when people don't like the books that we like or the movies that we like or they bash our favorite band or something like that. Um, so yeah, let's see. If anybody, someone says how old, how young are you? You'll never know. Um, if anybody wants to come up and debate this on mic, they're more than welcome to. I am keeping an eye on the guest request down there. Um, so yeah, beauty is evidence for God. Yeah, because, uh, like I said before, things that are beautiful, things that strike us as profoundly beautiful, these are things that usually come about as the result of artistic intent. Thus, we see there's artistic intent behind the universe. This is what theism has been saying all along, and if you disagree, you're welcome to come up and debate it. Somebody, yeah, somebody come up. We've got a lot of atheists. We've got a lot of atheists in the, arg in the chat who are saying this is not evidence. If that's the case, then come up and let's talk about it, and let's have a... Uh, Let's have a dialogue. I've got to find my water bottle over here. Somebody said, <clears throat> it's pointless to debate someone's belief. There's nothing to gain. Well, I disagree. I think the process of debating and having these type of dialogues is what allows us to further understand other people, further humanize people we disagree with. And I think it ultimately helps us lead us to, group, lead us to truth. So if you disagree with that, then that's fine. But I'm going to see if we can get some people up here. Okay, we've got someone coming up. We've got Elohim. As he comes up, uh, what's up, Elohim? Are you disagreeing with the uh, the chat or disagreeing? With the evidence for God? Yeah, I do. I do disagree. Okay. So what is what is your objection then? So you do you believe that someone who is a beautiful or made by God, super beautiful, right? And uh, how many cells does that person have? How many cells you think? And that human is there. 
how many cells? Like yeah, uh, how many? Yeah. Uh, I don't know the exact number, a lot, billions, trillions. You'd have to ask a, a biologist to get the exact number. Okay, good. And uh, how many cells does a bacteria have? I don't know. If you, any, any question you ask is how many cells are in X, I'm not going to be able to tell you because I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but yes, like uh, have you taken a basic biology, like how many cells does uh, a bacteria have? I'll go with billions. A bacteria has a billion cells? Yeah, so uh, I, then if you tell me to guess, that's just what I'm going to guess. Yeah, so I have no clue off the top of my head. Now, I will point out, how is this related to whether or not beauty... Okay, so I, I'm coming to that. So, and how many cells does a virus has? How many cells? I I have no clue. I can I can give you an estimate, um, I don't know, thousands, millions. Like, I have no many, I have no clue how many cells are in these different organisms. Okay, good. So a virus has no cells. A virus is just RNA. It means less than even a single cell. A bacteria has just one cell. Okay. What and is whether or not beauty is evidence for God. What okay, is- so I'm coming to that. I'm coming to the point. I'm I'm gonna get you how relevant it is. So in a, a human, a typical human had about a trillion cells. Okay. Right. Okay. And so. The beauty made by God, a trillion cell, a trillion cell building getting demolished by a single cell bacteria. How you think a super, a super God created a human with a trillion cell, making that human super beautiful, but it can get demolished, it can get crumbled to nothing by a single cell bacteria or a less than a cell virus? Let's talk about the, the premise of your argument. So the que- it seems like you're implying that for some object which appears beautiful to us, if that object can be easily destroyed, you seem to think that that means that that object was not the result of artistic intent. Is that your is that your argument? Yeah. How does that make God intelligent? How does you how? Okay. So let's, okay. So I want to let's play out that premise, right? Okay. I I just want to make sure because I don't want to misrepresent you. Right, you're, you're saying that if, if some object, we're looking at an object, and whether it be a person, a mountain, whatever, we're looking at an object, and we're trying to say, did that thing, it, did it come about from the um, intent of an artist? Is there artistic intent behind it? Your argument is, if that thing can be really easily destroyed, like if, I, if, if the beauty of that thing can be tarnished very easily, then you think that we are justified in saying, nope, that's not the result of artistic intent. Because it sounds like that's your argument. I just want to make completely clear. I, I want to make sure I'm understanding you. Yeah, you are. We, you exactly got it. That's my point. My point is just to summarize it. Okay, so you don't think, you don't think that um, the Mona Lisa had artistic intent behind it? Mona Lisa is not a human being. Mona Lisa is just a creation. Be consistent. You just admitted that a premise of your argument is that if it can be con- if it can be destroyed easily then it's not the result of artistic intent that means every statue every painting um anything along those lines uh, an afghan knit by your grandmother all of these things can be destroyed incredibly easily and by your reasoning that means that those things are not the result of artistic intent that's your argument. So that's that's where no, your I'm argument not, is going. Uh, okay, here, here, here is my point. Do not lose my point. My point is not about something human created. You put up saying beauty is the evidence for God. So when God makes something beautiful like a human being, which can, God is the builder. God is the creator of human being. At the same time, God created a virus and bacteria to destroy what he made. How no, logical is that? Let's, let's How logical is that? Just tell me. Well, no, okay, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's pump the brakes and walk it back here. So you're importing several assumptions here about you're uh, assuming that <clears throat> things like viruses and things like that are, se- are themselves things that God has created. I, I would bicker with that. But tell you what, for, I'm going to look over that because I think that a lot of these things like viruses, these are the result of what was created kind of decaying and the result of the world being kind of um, subjected uh, to, subjected to evil spirits and sin and stuff like that. But I'm going to look back at that for a second and say, okay, let's say God created, let's say God is the direct cause of viruses and things like that. The fact that there is something beautiful in, God, in God's creation, let's say a human, that can be destroyed by another thing in God's creation, that does not undercut the fact that creation as a whole 
is suffused with beauty, as can be seen behind me, um, things like this. So, like, that doesn't affect the fact that we still have beauty, profound beauty in the natural world. And we have to have an explanation for that profound beauty. Now, if you say, why would God do that? Like, I, I don't know. I could say that. I could say, oh, I have no clue why God would allow that. And that would not get you any further in your rejection of my argument because that's completely irrelevant. The, the question at hand is, we see profound beauty in the natural world. I'm thinking here of stars, galaxies, mountains, rivers, um, daffodils, you know, what have you. Okay. Profound beauty in the natural world. And usually, our, all of our inductive evidence tells us that beauty okay, okay, does not come okay. about so, in the absence of artistic so, content. So, so let me let me ask you something in the middle. Let, yeah, one second, I'm lost, I'm let lost. me ask you something in the middle. Okay. Yeah. What's Short. Up? Okay. How beautiful you look to a bacteria, or how beautiful you look to a coronavirus? Did the coronavirus get? Yeah. I don't think those things can perceive beauty, so I don't think I look beautiful at all to them because they have no perception. So beautiful is in beauty is in in the beholder's eye. That's why to you the other well, human can look beautiful. Okay. Something which looks you just yeah, answered. Let's, let's okay, let me talk. Let me it talk. Is. Just one second. Just okay, give me no. one minute, please. Let me talk. So something which looks beautiful to a human or a human eye is not beautiful at all you just answered yourself you say you don't ever let's think you look let's beautiful to a coronavirus about. well let's stop right there let's talk about that you just suggested that because a coronavirus doesn't believe that i'm beautiful i'm therefore not actually beautiful okay a coronavirus doesn't believe that i have a water bottle in front of me that doesn't mean there's not actually a water bottle in front of me the fact that an object which has no consciousness no ability to perceive or have beliefs of any kind the fact that it doesn't have a belief about me tells us nothing about the objectivity of that thing itself um, yeah, so that's it. Beauty is subjective. You know, you okay, know. So let's, so let's, so what is your argument that all beauty, of beauty, no, so let me, let me, I'm going to ask a question. What is okay. your argument, what is your evidence for making the claim that all beauty is subjective? That all, all statements about beauty have no objective truth to them? You just answer it like I asked you a simple question. How beautiful you look to a virus or a bacteria of no, any kind. They, you I just said... And so right. it's subjective means something is subjective means only you perceive it in your own way. We humans look at a beauty in a different way than a dog. You might even don't look beautiful to a dog. Yeah. So subjective means something is not a universal truth. Okay, there is so nothing so, touch. Okay, so yes or no, does my water bottle believe that you exist? Water bottle has no life. It is not, it's not a living thing. Wait, wait, wait. Yes or no? Does my water bottle believe that you exist? Ne water bottle? Never. Yes. Okay, so this, this thing, uh, you can't see it. Uh, this thing has no belief that you exist. Which yes. means, according to you, it is subjective whether or not you exist. There is no objectivity to whether or not Elohim exists. That's but, the argument you're giving. You're, you're committed okay. to it. Your entire existence is subjective. Yeah, but the water bottle will not do harm to your body like a virus and bacteria. You're changing your you're changing your argument. Your argument before was X does not perceive me as beautiful, therefore I am subjective. If you're consistent with your reasoning, then that means yes. your water bottle does not perceive and, you as existing. Okay, I'm do not look my ground is my ground is still to something or to some some living object i'm not talking about not living like okay, let's say we can take we can take a dog i have a plant somewhere around here um do i have a plant yeah i've got a plant i've got a plant behind me here does the plant behind me you can't see it you'll trust, trust me i have a plant behind me does that plant believe that you exist it's a living thing does it believe that you exist plants have no nervous system do you understand that plants have no nervous system does the coronavirus have a nervous system it does. Okay, it's so a wait. You think a, a coronavirus is more capable of believing that you exist than my plant does? Yeah, but I'm okay, now. Okay, wait, so wait. Does the coronavirus? Let's just do this. And do you think a coronavirus believes that Elohim exists? You like your your name is Elohim. Do you think a coronavirus believes that you exist? Do you think E. coli believes that you exist? When I try to compare col coronavirus to humans, I'm not talking about the perception. The per when we I got to talk about the per beautiful how the perception 
it has to be something bigger like a dog, a cat. I talked about Corona because it's, when I talked about Corona, I was trying to tell you that we can get demolished by a single cell or a virus which has no cells at all. Just RNA can demolish a human being with trillion cells. That's a different that concept. You, you switched arguments because I addressed that. I because you never know, you told me that you, you told me that you off and let somebody else come up. I'm just telling you, I'm down to talk for another 10 or 15 minutes until I let someone else come up. But if you keep yelling over me and like, I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna be honest, I'm not gonna have that. Okay. So a while ago, you initially brought up the coronavirus because you were doing this. Oh, well, this can be easily destroyed argument. I pointed out that argument was absurd because that would entail denying artistic intent behind any type of painting or object or anything like that. Then you switched, then you brought up a new argument and you said, okay, well- I switched because oh, you say the virus has 10 trillion cells. I, if you don't I mean, switched, you the only reason I switched to a bigger, okay. You, you switched arguments, then you started asking me, you then yeah. you started arguing that beauty was subjective, okay? So you switched from the, the, the coronavirus can destroy me argument, then you switched over to, okay, well, beauty is subjective. That was your next argument. And I asked you to support your claim that beauty is subjective. And what did you do? You argued that because the coronavirus did not perceive me as beautiful, therefore the coronavirus is, uh, therefore I am not objectively beautiful or something like that, which is, I mean, I'm, I'm clearly objectively beautiful. I'm kidding. But so you switched arguments, okay? And so now we're tracking on that argument. So you need to make up your mind, what argument are you gonna try to bring to the, the table here? Because okay, right can now, you give Give me just one minute let me clarify it to you okay so i switched to the from coronavirus to a bigger animal like dog and cat because you said you believe a virus and bacteria has a billion cells so that's not correct they don't have a billion cells so i have to give you something realistic okay dog and cat they got a billion cells but how beautiful you appear to your cat and dog none they will never choose you over their own cat and dog try to breed with you. So beauty is subjective. It's just within our own species. You clearly never had a dog try to hump your leg. That's all I'm going to say there. Uh, okay, so I say that as a joke. Um, okay, so you haven't actually presented an argument. I've already addressed this, uh, whether or not other, whether or not things that have no ability to perceive us as beautiful, whether or not they have perceptions of beauty, that doesn't affect whether or not we actually have beauty. Have beauty. I don't think my dog understands lots of things. I don't think my dog understands um, advanced quantum mechanics, general relativity, um, calculus. I don't think my dog. I don't have a dog. If I had a dog, I don't think it would understand any of those things. That does not mean that there's objective truth behind any of those things. So if you want to create an argument against, you know, the objectivity of beauty, you need to go further than that. I do see that we have two people waiting in the chat. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to end this pretty quick if, unless you have some new argument to present. Okay. I will just finalize my argument and then you can have them. Okay. So my last say is you can call yourself or anyone beautiful, super beautiful, but that's just your the subjective perception within the human race or within the race of their own. Other than that, there is no truth. One that person is gone, he is gone. Just is a living organic material. We all are nothing. We are just a decomposing organic materials. So once we are gone, we never leave anything behind. If you think beauty is everlasting, you have no one left their beautiness behind. I'm done. Okay, so that's that's your argument. I've addressed that you didn't present any actual arguments for beauty being subjective. I pointed out that we have intuitions, that there is object. Uh, some people are asking whether what the text in the background says. I'm sorry I got smushed. Um, it says beauty is evidence for God changed my mind. Um, yeah, so so I've addressed your argument. So I'm going to go ahead and let somebody else come up here. I do appreciate you coming up and chatting with me, though. All right, so we got, let's see, we've got Steve coming up. Everybody give a round of applause for Steve as he takes the stage. Oh, please yeah. don't do not applaud me. Hey, man, what's up? Well, not much. How are you? I'm doing well. What's on your mind? What are you thinking about all this? Uh, well, first, I want to commend you for your patience with that last guy. He was, I don't know if I could have lasted that long. <laughs> um, that being said, though, I, what, I'm i sorry I didn't interrupt you. No, you're good. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I figured you have an objection. You can go ahead and present it, and I'll hear you out. <clears throat> yeah, so that being said, I do... Um, can't say I agree with them, but I, my 
argument was going to be similar, that beauty is subjective. Um, I'd also say that that's a huge leap to say that beauty is evidence for God. Like, <clears throat> the logic doesn't follow. Okay. Um, so, tell you what, let me... It seems like there's two things there. What constitutes evidence and whether or not beauty, whether or not something is um, subjective or objective. So when we talk about something being evidence for God or, or evidence in general, I'm taking evidence to be the sense of if this set of data is unlikely under hypothesis X, but it's more likely under hypothesis Y, then that data seems to be evidence for hypothesis Y. Or maybe another way we could phrase this is if this data is expected under Y, but not expected under X, then that constitutes evidence for, um, then that piece of data can said to be evidence for Y and not evidence for X. So under that format, my argument then is that beauty, specifically beauty that we see in the natural world and um, our experiences of beauty, that this is more expected under theism than it is under naturalism. Um, so that's that's kind of what I mean by evidence there. And then if you want to address w why you think that that's problematic for the reasons I offered, you, we can we can get into that. But I wanted to see if you had any arguments for why you think beauty is um, is subjective. Uh, personally, I feel like that's apparent um, in the fact that you know uh, taking beauty as a, a more broad spectrum not just like the things we see but the things that we experience right like music movies media of all that kind everyone has their own taste you know there's a lot of things that sorry my cat's being a little crazy uh <clears throat> there's a lot of things a lot of types of music that i don't like um that just doesn't appeal to me i don't find it beautiful in the slightest bit and there's a lot that i like that i know other people are like how do you listen to that drivel it sounds like just pure noise to me <clears throat> and that that would be uh, at least part of my my evidence for why I think beauty is subjective. And you can say the same thing about art. You know, you can go to a, a muse an art museum and people can be absolutely moved to tears by by a painting or a sculpture or something. And the next person comes come by and, you know, look at it and say, oh, that's neat, and then walk by. They don't get, they don't feel the same sense of beauty that the other person did. Okay. So let's, let's then um, hunker down on that, uh, that idea that you presented. So you're presenting um, the argument that Beliefs about beauty are not objective because people have different beliefs about what is beautiful or what is not. So I think there are uh, two issues here. The first issue is that merely disagreeing about a topic doesn't mean that the topic at hand is actually um, subjective. So there are people right now who think it is perfectly okay to... Um, I have to be careful what I say, otherwise TikTok might get onto me, to sexually assault uh, children. I'll, I'll say it that way. Hopefully I don't get docked. Um, there are people who think it is morally fine to, um, to sexually abuse children, uh, do child pornography, things like that. There, so there are also people out here who think that that is wrong. So we have two different sets of, of intuitions about, um, about that thing. Now, I hope that you agree with me that the mere fact that there are people who disagree with that, that doesn't mean that it's really just subjective about whether or not that action is, is wrong or not. Um, so that's another area in the, in the values field where this is clearly um, not the case. But even about things in um, more objective and clear cut things, there are people who don't think the Holocaust happened, right? So there are people who, di who disagree with that. Um, that doesn't mean that that is something that is um, subjective. So I think we have to be careful with merely pointing to saying, okay, well, people disagree disagree about some things. Now, I, I, wait, I would, I would put, what, yeah, so let me add one more thing and then I'll let you sure. from it. Um, so I would add also that we do seem to have, we share, at least with when it comes to the natural world, um, I think we share a lot of intuitions about things being beautiful. So I gave the example before of, you know, if, I, if I'm you and I, we hike to the top of a mountain and we're sitting there at the top and, you know, we're, look, we're looking at something maybe like this, right, uh, which seems very beautiful to me. And then, you say, oh, like, I, I I, think this feces that has maggots growing in it, this is more beautiful. Would you say that your statement about the, about the maggots-filled feces, that being beautiful, is as equally, is as equally true as my statement that something like, you know, this is beautiful? Do you think one of those things does not objectively merit a certain type of response, which the other doesn't? So I, I don't like your examples, honestly. For like the first couple examples you had were 
like like the thing about SA, <clears throat> I mean that that right there is objectively wrong because you're taking away another human's agency when you do something like that, right? Uh, same thing with with the Holocaust. That's objectively it happened because we have evidence for it. Um, you can't have evidence for something being beautiful because everyone. What's that? Pause there. I, yeah, I don't want to interrupt you too much, but um, I've learned that sometimes with lives, um, I can talk, and I know I just did, I can talk for two or three minutes, and then you can talk for two or three minutes, and then the amount of things to address keeps keeps lining up further and further. So you said that um, the uh, the SA thing, which will, that's a good abbreviation, um, you said that the SA thing is morally wrong because it takes away another person's agency. However, I can just scoot this back a step and I can say, okay, so you have the moral intuition. You have this, you know, this experience um, that taking away a person's agency is wrong. Well, okay, there are people who think, who don't think it's objectively wrong to take away a person's moral agency. So now we're back to where we started. All you did is scoot this, is scoot this back a step. Now you use the same like, thing regarding like the whole but your examples were not analogous to to the idea of beauty because like there's no objective uh evidence to say that something is beautiful because it's what you, the person how the person perceives it and and what you know it's all internalized that's why it's subjective because there's no you can't point to something and say see because this is in this like orientation it's beautiful but if i turn it this way it wouldn't be beautiful boy so let's let's talk that so you're seeming to suggest mm -hmm. that when we're talking about um, whether or not something is objective, uh, objectively the case, we have to be able to point to some object outside of our experiences and say this verifies my my thing. Is that am I getting that right? Um, that's basically what I said. Yes. Now I could be wrong about the definition of objective, but yes, it needs objective things need to uh, they have to be verified. They have to be the same in every situation. Okay, if it's so, objective. so there are some problems there because that argument is going to cut equally against thinking SA is wrong. Because when we come to the table with SA, we're, we're essentially relying on our moral intuitions, which we look around and we're usually quite happy that other people share our moral intuitions. So you could potentially say, okay, look, all these people share my moral intuitions, therefore there's something objective about this. If that works for you, I'm going to do the same thing with the mountain scenario. So I'm going to get off great there. However, Anytime we are pointing to something in reality and saying, oh, look, this verifies, you know, this this thing I have, that itself is a, an appeal to experience. You're, that is something that you're experiencing. It seems to you um, like that is the case. You you have certain rational intuitions um, that you use to infer things. So really, you're not getting out of the um, you're not getting out of your head so so much as you seem to think that you are. Well, well, here's the thing. When you when you see something beautiful, right? How do you know that it's beautiful? Because I see it. I, I, I clearly experience right. it as beautiful. Right. Right. So how can you say if if we both look at the same thing and you say, oh, my gosh, that's so beautiful. And I say, eh, it's cool. It's fine. Like, I don't think how can you tell me if I'm right or wrong? Right. Okay. Like if like but on the, on the other side of that, like go back to the the 1940s Germany. Um, you could you could say like one person could say i'm not going to put anybody in the scenario because i don't want to put any, this on any in particular person but one person could say yes that happened another person can say no that didn't happen and the person that said yes it does can say well here there's this they can lay out all the evidence for it because it's very well documented right so they can show that evidence and say this is why i know that this is real it's objectively true you can't do that when you're trying to convey that something is beautiful or attractive or even if it's like something you enjoy like like i was saying about music earlier i can lay out everything everything single thing i like about a particular band or a song and it won't matter if that song doesn't click with you right you won't see the beauty in it that i do yeah so let me ask them um because i think the problem here is going to come down to whether or not whether or not our, our experiences and our moral intuitions, or, or excuse me, not moral, just intuitions in general, whether or not our seemings, what, what it seems to us to be the case, whether or not that's something that's innocent until proven guilty or guilty till proven innocent. So at, right now, I take it that you're, you're probably sitting or standing somewhere and maybe you have a phone in front of you or a desk in front of you or something like that. Um, it seems to you that there is something in front of you, right? Okay, how do you show that? How do you how do you prove that, right? In this way that you're saying I can't point to something 
um, outside of my experiences with beauty and say, okay, how do I show that to you? Well, okay, how do you how do you show that this thing that you're experiencing, or maybe another way is, how do you know that this what you're experiencing right now is actually the case and not merely mistaken or subjective, like you're suggesting beauty is? So I can't because I can only. Um, I can only have my experiences, right? And I can express that to other people. I can show you a video or a picture or something, but no one else has the experience that I have in my in my head. Just like no one has the experiences that you have in your head. Mm-hmm. Um, but that I, I feel like that's muddying the waters and and slightly changing let's, the let's subject. More, let's make it more simple then. Um, how do you know that the objects that are sitting in front of you are actually sitting in front of you? Because I can see, feel, and touch them. So, so it's just your experience. It just seems to you like they're there. But you, you, can't, you can't kind of point to anything outside of your experiences to say, aha, this proves this experience is valid, right? You just you have that experience. It seems to you that that's the case. And so you think you're rationally justified in thinking that the, in, in trusting that experience until you get some type of defeat. Sure. But I'll, I could also, if I was with somebody and there's, say, there's a chair in front of me, I could say, hey, there's a chair in front of me. Look, and I'll, I'll touch it and feel it. And the other person can say, wait, oh, wait, you're right. No. There is a chair in front of you. But how do you know there's a person there with you? How do you know because they're actually there? Okay, so now you're just, but no, now you're, you're muddy in the water. No, I, no, I don't think you're actually arguing good faith anymore. No, no, because this is important because this type of, uh, it, it all comes down to our epistemology. Um, wait, wait, the, the thing wait, I'm pointing out here is that when it comes to our where... experiences, or, so when it comes to our experiences of what it seems like, whether or not it seems like there's an object in front of me, whether or not it seems like there's a person there, whether or not it, it seems that this is, is beautiful, these things um, can rightly be taken as innocent until proven guilty. If it seems to you that there's a table in front of you, I think you're rationally justified in thinking that there's a table in front of you, unless you have some some defeater to that. Now, if as we're talking, you wake up and you know Morpheus is is pulling you out of the, the matrix and he's unplugging the things and you're like, oh, like I guess I didn't have a table. So okay, there, that's a defeater. Now you have a reason to think you didn't actually have a table in front of you. However, apart from something like that happening, you were completely justified in going for with your your seemings and taking them as, as innocent until proven guilty. And here's what I'm just going to ask you and for the audience. For me, it, it seems quite clearly that something like this, like we, we have things like this in the natural world, it seems quite clear to me that things like this merit a certain type of response, that things like feces filled with maggots don't. It is as clear to me that um, there things like this are appropriate to respond to in a certain way that's not appropriate to respond to feces filled or a maggot filled feces. That's just as clear to me as there's a box sitting in front of me. And so if you want to say that that intuition I have is wrong, you can make that argument. I'm just not seeing it. And I think if most people were honest with themselves, when it comes to when they look at things, beautiful things in nature, they would agree that there is, there is something about the mountain, the trees, the daffodils. There's something about that that it is more worthy to give it uh, the praise of beauty than it is to give that praise to the, the feces filled with yeah, maggots. But, that's, but that's, that's not what you're saying, though. You're saying it's, it's objectively beautiful. And yes, when you compare a beautiful landscape like that behind you, yes, I know I just used the word beautiful, to a pile of feces, of course the, the landscape is going to be more beautiful. However, if you have two different people and one person is really into mountain ranges and one person is really into, like, you know, large, wide open fields, and you show them a picture of a mountain, the one that really likes mountains is going to be way more into that picture than the guy that's in the open fields, right? But, but most people would probably still call both of them beautiful. In fact, there have been studies done about how do we, how do we as humans generally respond to beauty in nature? It seems to be pretty widespread, um, I guess you could say, continuity or consensus in us responding to nature as beautiful. So e- even if I'm more of a mountains guy, and I'm a more I'm more of a mountains than a beach guy myself, I'll let that slip. Um, I'm more of a mountains Same. guy. If I look at the beach, I'm still gonna be like, yeah, that's that's beautiful. Like that still strikes me. That, that that's fair. That's fair. Um, so yeah. So let me tell you what. Let me hit you with something else. Um, uh, well, before so, you do that, before you do that, can you yeah, tie okay. this into it being proof for a deity? Well, so you know, no, I didn't say proof. I said evidence. Now, notice earlier. Evidence. Yeah, I noticed earlier that um, I said that something counts as evidence if this is more expected under one hypothesis than the other. So if the world is not the result of artistic intent, um, I I think it's pretty unlikely that the world is going to turn out beautiful. And I I actually never made the claim to objective beauty. That's something that people have just come on and been like, oh, beauty is subjective. I actually think I can make this argument work regardless of whether or not um, I I argue for objective beauty. Um, And that's something I was going to get into. But so set that aside. Um, 
So it seems to me like it is more likely this this is more expected. Something beautiful is more expected if there's artistic intent behind it than if there is an artistic intent behind it. Usually, usually things that we do, they like, don't. It, just in general, things usually don't turn out beautiful unless we're trying to make them beautiful. And usually, even then, a lot of times they still turn out really crappy. There's there's a lot of bad artists in the world. There's a lot of bad painters, and and, and I'm saying that as one of them. Like there's lots of bad poets. Um, so when off the cuff, is if we see objects that that are beautiful. Um, just from what we know about, you know, how, how difficult it is to make beautiful things. That seems to things like, okay, that seems to indicate, like, okay, that's more expected if there was artistic intent. But here's the thing, even if, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, now you have to prove artistic intent. Like, no, just, no, I, I just offered, <clears throat> uh, I just offered evidence for artistic intent, which is artistic intent. Would you agree that artistic intent, usually in our experiences, if we encounter something beautiful, or it just in general, if we encounter something and it doesn't have artistic intent behind it, it usually doesn't turn out really breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, well, that is assuming that nature is artistically intended, which no, I don't well, believe it is. So I'm then I would I would disagree with you that. But then I would disagree with you. I would say a beautiful landscape is beautiful without artistic intent. Yeah, yeah. So, but then let's let's set aside nature, right? Let's just set aside nature um, because that's that's kind of the thing that's under the debate, right? So let's set aside that and talk about okay, non natural beauty things. Do things usually turn out beautiful in the absence of artistic intent? I mean, humans, some humans are beautiful and there's no artistic intent behind a human. But, but that's part of the natural beauty thing. So that's kind of, that's kind of, so, right, but, so here's what I'm thinking, right? Um, if you look at a building or if you look at... Wait, wait, um, wait but yeah. hold on. Let me, let me stop you though. We, there's evidence, right, that the things you're going to bring up are created by people. If you want to compare that to the natural world, you have to first establish that it was created with artistic intent first. No, 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 I don't. Because all, all we're talking about right now is like we can set aside the natural world stuff and we can just say in general. So if we're talking about it, we can't set it aside. No, so yeah. So the, the question um, the question at hand is, okay, we, we experience this stuff in the natural world. I think we experience stuff about um, the natural world being beautiful. And we're trying to figure out like, okay, if that was the case, if the natural world was beautiful, um, in this way that I'm suggesting, would that be evidence for God? Now, so that, that's kind of the argument that we have over here. And so what I'm saying is like, okay, let's say in general, just in general, when we see an object that is beautiful, whether it whether it's um, a, a painting or whether or not it's a house, whether or not it's, um, I don't know, like a phone case, like dealer's choice, what, in general, when we see an object that's beautiful, does that beauty generally imply do we usually infer rightly infer that there's artistic intent behind that beauty apart from things like mountains daffodils stuff like that because here's what i think i think that when we look at um things like cars um, when we look at uh, papers when we look at uh buildings generally things don't turn out really this aesthetically pleasing unless the, there's a, there's someone behind it who's trying to make it that way, aesthetically pleasing who, who's who's has an artistic intent behind it um like it's it, it usually is is pretty difficult to get like stuff like that to come about it doesn't usually just happen um and so because of that i'm saying okay well since usually um all my experiences indicate that beauty is something that comes about from artistic intent then I'm going to say, okay, well, the beauty in nature then seems to be that's more expected if there's artistic intent behind it, and it's not as expected if there isn't artistic intent behind it. I mean, that's, you know, I, I have no intention of changing your mind, but that is, you're missing a full step there, right? You say, okay, I see these things that are created, <clears throat> and I see the artistic intent behind them. Therefore, everything that I see with beauty must have artistic intent therefore must have a creator right is that generally like the the kind of logic path uh, that's a that's a pretty good sketch i'm inferring about the things that um that i experience and yeah. i'm yeah it's like i i feel like that's just kind of basic and inductive reason i think that's a pretty good sketch right but then we have again evidence to show that yes this thing was created a phone case okay cool. painting whatever but we don't have that evidence with anything in nature Okay, so, so, so the evidence, though, of the, the phone case being created, right? Um, what's the evidence of that, right? You're either probably going to appeal to any type of argument for why it is the phone case or the, the house or whatever. Why is, that, um, why is that created? 
you're going to do the same type of inductive reasoning that I'm doing. You're going to say, well, it's really, if I'm walking in the woods and I come across a house, let's, let's say it's a beautiful house, why not? Um, I, I'm going to say, okay, well, usually I know houses don't come about unless they're built by people. Like it's really unlikely that if, if there weren't builders behind this thing, that this would come about, like that's really improbable. And so when I see this and I say, okay, well, if there were builders behind this and that's way, it's way more expected that I would see a, a house here. So we do the same type of reasoning. These things you want to say, oh, but we have evidence there. That same thing that you're going to appeal to as evidence. I'm going to say, yeah, that reasoning is exactly what I'm using to say that we have evidence that the universe came about from it, artistic intents. And, and it, it's not though, because you have evidence that other houses were built by people. So you see a house in the woods. Well, you know, every other house you've ever seen was built by people. You see a, a, a mountain, you've never seen a mountain get built by people. And in fact, we have evidence that mountains are not intentionally created because of things like plate tectonics. Um, so we know that. So um, we know that, I don't want to interrupt you, sorry. We know that mountains aren't made intentionally. They're made by natural forces in the, in the earth with, you know, the magma and all, you know, the, the different layers of the, of the, the earth and all that junk. Like we know that that happens naturalistically. We can say the same thing about stars. We know how stars are made. They're made in nebulas and they're, you know, the gravity of the gases in there condense the, uh, the gases into a, a bigger and bigger ball of gas and it eventually becomes a star. It starts, starts getting so dense that it creates nuclear fusion in its core. Yeah, so, so let, let's, um, let's talk about that then. So you're saying, okay, well, listen, um, these things we know have naturalistic mechanisms that go about to um, creating them, right? Therefore, that's not the result of some type of, you know, artistic intent. Now, that doesn't seem, and, and I'll go back to your, your house analogy uh, of, of the people seeing houses and, and that are built and stuff like that in a second. And if I forget, remind me. Um, that doesn't seem like a good argument. Because in any case in which we look at um, uh, something that comes about through some type of mechanistic means, or excuse me, anytime we see people who are um, creating something beautiful, Often there are points in that in which we could zoom in and we could say, okay, look, there's something mechanistic going on here. So we could look at something like um, an artist who's using um, a digital creation, right? It was using like a, a pad to draw something and create a work of art through a, a digital format. You could, you could zoom down and you could say, okay, listen, but we know that these pixels on the page, they are, um, they're becoming bright because of there's an electrical impulse that's coming, that's, you know, coming out from, uh, this other section of the computer and this is coming from this wall outlet. You could give a mechanistic explanation of that process, but the fact that there's that mechanistic explanation of the process doesn't change the, f change the fact that the best explanation for why that mechanistic process is giving rise to the beautiful thing is that there is an artistic intent that is using that mechanistic process to bring about what is beautiful. And so if we're looking at something like trees, daffodils, mountains, whatever, and we're saying, okay, well, you know, I, I know a tree, I know it gets, you know, I get, it gets energy from the sun and it does this and it's all mechanisms. I'm like, great, okay, like, what's the best explanation for why we have this beauty creating mechanism? Evolution. But that, but that doesn't, but that doesn't apply to things like, so there are several issues here. Um, that doesn't apply to whether or not, um, to, to things that are not alive at all, like galaxies, um, beaches, mountains, stuff like that. But also that doesn't even apply to things like daffodils and tree. Like why would we expect evolution to, um, to create an object that is inherently beautiful? If evolution is not something that has artistic intent behind it. See, if you okay, pause, like I do that there's artistic intent behind evolution, then you get past the issue. But if you don't think there's any artistic if, intent there, then we shouldn't expect these things to be beautiful. What if instead of artistic intent, that plants and thing and, and the you know world uh life evolved as it did <clears throat> and then we as humans also evolved to find these things beautiful for whatever particular reason maybe that evolution was uh is intrinsic so that we you know have a want to protect it right um mm -hmm. there's many reasons that that could be true but but maybe that's it you know because we obviously there's a good reason we evolutionarily think that other human beings are attractive because the you know we want to mate and make more make more humans so we can have you know more generations so i think you're you're kind of putting the cart before the horse a little bit when you say things like that because you're you're assuming the this artistic intent and that we're seeing it as beautiful because it's beautiful not it's we see it as beautiful because it's beneficial for us to see it as beautiful or something along those lines. Like, I'm not saying that's what I'm, what my. Yeah. So let me say why I think that that response is inferior to the response that, to the explanation that I'm giving. 
So um, there are several things here. So when we're seeking to explain some some set of data that we have, we should try to explain. Um, we should try to explain all of the data. And part of the data of what we have to explain is that we have these kind of objectivist intuitions. We kind of have these intuitions about, no, like the, the mountains and the daffodils really do merit a response that the, um, that the feces don't. Now, my explanation, it preserves those objectivist intuitions. It preserves those intuitions, whereas yours doesn't. My response preserves this intuition that we have when we experience beauty, that there is something profound and important in and of itself of that beauty. So my explanation preserves that intuition, that experience, that many people, including atheistic philosophers, recognize as something that they experience. Whereas your explanation doesn't preserve that experience, yours denies it, and it degrades beauty. Your beauty, your uh, view brings beauty low and makes it trivial and um, yeah, it just degrades it. But not only that is, so one second, let me finish up real quick and then I'll, I'll get back to you. And then um, tell you what, I'll finish up on this and we'll have a few more minutes. I know there are other people in the chat I wanna, I wanna bring them in, but I've, I've really enjoyed talking with you about this. Um, not only that, I think, so this is the common explanation, which is okay, well, you know, we just kind of evolved to, um, we kind of evolved to experience beauty. So let's say I, st I take a step back and I say, okay, let's say I just grant that, you know, okay, I have no evidence for objective beauty or something like that. Let's say I just take that aside. I'm going to say, it's like, what's more like, like, what is more likely for us to be in a world in which we have embodied agents that we experience beauty? We even experience that. Whoops, spam call. Um, it seems to me like evolution doesn't even give us a great explanation for, for that for several reasons. First off, when we observe what we see as beautiful in the world, it does not track onto um, an evolutionary heritage. We find all types of things beautiful that would not be evolutionary advantageous, advantageous to us. We find the Antarctic beautiful. We find arid deserts beautiful. We find galaxies and things in the sky that we never would have even been able to see up until this point in our evolutionary heritage. We find those beautiful. We find microscopic things beautiful. Um, so these are not all things that can be just, if, we, if we're looking at what we find beautiful, they just don't seem to track onto what's survivally advantageous to us. But not only that, is it doesn't seem, and this will be my last point and I'll turn it over to you. Um, it also doesn't seem that we would expect to have um, beauty as an, as an evolutionary advantage. There doesn't seem to be any type of evolutionary advantage in finding things beautiful. And if anything, um, finding things beautiful seems like an evolutionary waste because now we're wasting time, we're wasting resources um, to, you know, making paintings or standing and looking at mountains that could have been spent reproducing, um, you know, finding food, stuff like that. So just across the whole, I don't think that um, your explanation, it has to ignore certain facts, with my, which my view uh, uh, explains. And then also, even the facts that your view supposedly explains, it doesn't explain them that well. Whereas my view, it explains, it explains everything simply parsimoniously and in a compact way. Um, I, I mean, that, so I still think you, you even kind of said it even though you didn't say it um, like you, the problem still is that beauty is subjective. Like, cause you know, not everybody finds every type of landscape necessarily beautiful. I get that there is a bit of objective. Um, oh, so why so should I give up my intuition just because someone else disagrees? Like if I see yeah. the mountain as beautiful, if I see the view of the right. mountain as beautiful, so and it's you beautiful disagree you. and you say, I find the feces beautiful. Why should the fact that you disagree, why should that affect my confidence that this is really meritoriously beautiful? Why, why should I care just because you, you disagree with me? No, you shouldn't. Because that's but that's what subject, subjective means. It means it's different to different people or a different out, you know perspective. Um, it, you can't you can't call beauty objective because not everyone finds all of the same things beautiful. And I mean, the the feces thing is just a poor example in, in my opinion um, because. It's, it's not a like for like, like if you're talking about, like some people think the ocean is beautiful. Personally, I'm flipping terrified of the ocean. Um, some people think mountains and deserts are beautiful. I don't think a desert is very beautiful. I certainly don't think Antarctica is beautiful. I think it's interesting. I would love to visit, but I don't think it's beautiful. So but I, I guess, okay. So um, here's a thought I had. So you're saying they're not like to like, could you explain a little bit more there? Yeah. You're, you're comparing a landscape to a pile of poop. Yeah, but so why is that not like for like? Be because one's a landscape and one's a pile of poop. But when you say that, 
you're assuming there's something objectively more beautiful about the one. Like your 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 objection only works because you yourself so, recognize that one of these is a landscape. It's just a beautiful landscape, and this other no, thing is one stinky. of them is like you're you're using one of the them is not human waste. You're against me that I'm directly no. appealing to. All I'm, you could do, but you could do that with any other thing, almost right. You could you could compare a can of Coca Cola to a pile of poop. I would say that's not a good comparison because one is a it was human excrement with bugs in it, and the other is just a can of soda. But wait, if we're talking about aesthetic, which one of those is more beautiful? Do you not think one of those is more beautiful than the other? Do you not think one of those is less beautiful? But aesthetics isn't beauty. Aesthetics is aesthetics. No, uh, discussions of beauty is um, something that is within the field of aesthetics. Sure, sure. But, like, I could think something is aesthetically cool looking, right? It doesn't have to be beautiful necessarily. Like a dude or a lady in full play armor is fucking cool as hell to me. Sorry for swearing. I apologize. I'm trying not to do that. Um... But, you know, not necessarily beautiful. I find other men aesthetically pleasing. I'm not attracted to them physically. Like, I don't think they're beautiful, but I think they're aesthetically pleasing. You know, that doesn't necessarily equate to beauty. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you could, so it, it, would you say that um, beauty, cause I, I take beauty as kind of um, a form of positive aesthetic experience. And so it may be that I was just using terms that I take synonymous and you don't. And that's fine. If that's the case, I can I can um I can use different language if that's a hang up. That's not a problem. I, I tend to use and when I have talked about this in fact, I tend to talk about um experiencing beauty as having a type of positive ex aesthetic experience. Um so with the with the Coca-Cola can and the uh, the feces do you think one of those is less beautiful than the other in like an objective way? I, I don't like the, um, the, the word you're using, but I do find one less aesthetically pleasing than the other, yes. Okay, so if somebody came along and they were like, hey, uh, Steve, you're wrong, dude. That, that, that Coca-Cola can, it's just, it's objectively more beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, whatever. It's objectively better. Or excuse me, the Coca-Cola can, can is a, a, objectively worse aesthetically uh, than the poo. Are you going to be persuaded by that? No. Are you going to are you going to abandon your position? Right, because be, uh, and that just supports my point that beauty is subjective, not objective. He can't convince me because there's no evidence. He can't change the way I feel about it. He or or they, you know, so, he can't change the way I feel about it. And is objectively more beautiful than the poop. Do what? You don't think the can is objectively more beautiful than the poop? Beauty is not a word I would use to describe a can of cola or a poop. Okay, but so, that... yeah, but so more, be more beautiful, right? I, I don't look at a cola can and say, man, that's, that's the stuff. Sorry, Coca-Cola, unless you want to sponsor me. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't look at a Coca-Cola can and say, yeah, that's beautiful. But if I'm, if I'm looking at that in comparison to poop, I'm going to say the Coca-Cola can is more beautiful. It, it is more meritous. Or, or maybe we could go this the other way and say um, the poop is more hideous. It is more repulsive from an aesthetic standpoint, objectively. It, it merits our, our aesthetic disgust. Sure. More, okay, so, and, and, and that's subjective. Do you not feel intuitively, like objectively, like it seems to really merit that more than the Coca-Cola can? To me, yes. I, and that's why this is a bad example because they're so diametrically opposed, right? Because they. Than that it's, it, seems like, it seems objectively like this one thing merits this and the other doesn't. And what I'm saying to you is you don't have to give up that intuition. Like when we look at the mountain and we look at the feces and we say, man, hmm, one of these sure does seem more meritous of having beauty attributed to it than the other. I'm going to say that intuition that you have, good. That's a good intuition. You get to keep that under my view. But if you go with your view, you have to toss that intuition in the trash bin and say, well, you know, really it's all just evolutionary. One's not objectively more meritorious than the other and, and go along your way. So this is a boon for theism under my explanation is those intuitions that you have there. I say you get to keep those. <laughs> and also you get to keep all the intuitions about there's something really, truly profound and significant in beauty. So, so uh, uh, all right. Um, 
Yeah, that, but again, that's why the poop is a bad example because yeah, evolutionarily we should want not want want nothing to do with it because it's full of bacteria. It's going to make us sick. It's it's what's left over after we finish processing our food. But here's something for you, just to just to drive home my point that, that beauty. I'm gonna let subject. you have the last word because someone uh, Bart's been waiting in the chat, so I'm gonna let you have the last word on this. So go ahead and try try not to take more than like a minute or or two max. Just, take me, just a second, yeah. Two okay. people go to two different locations, completely different landscapes. They both say. This is the most beautiful place on earth. Which one is correct? They is can't both, if it's objective, if it's objective, they cannot both be correct. One has to be correct if, it, if beauty is objective and not subjective. Are you asking this to me or, or is that your it, last it, word? That, you that can be a, it doesn't have to be answered yet. It can be rhetorical. I mean, you know. But but again, that's just kind of my point is beauty is subjective. It's all in the eye of the beholder. We all choose, not choose, but we all just intrinsically kind of know what's beautiful to us. And not everybody has the same idea of beauty. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate you. I'm going to let Bart come up. I do appreciate you well, coming up, Steve. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Great combo. All right, we've got Bart coming up. I'm going to disconnect, disconnect you, Steve. Dope. Okay, what's up, Bart? Hey, Philosopher's Garb, uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. That was a great uh, discussion you had. Uh, hopefully I wasn't rushing anything by being in the queue. No, dude, you're good. You're good. I'm trying to, um, my, my intuition is, or my intuition, my disposition is to not pay attention to the clock and then we're like an hour in. And I, I want to, if I see people in there, I do want to give them the chance to come up and give their thoughts. Um, so yeah, what you thinking? Yeah, the, uh, the main thing that I wanted to come up and uh, talk to you, I mean, I, I agree with you more uh, along these lines in, in general. I'm not sure if you remember when we talked about uh, some of these issues um, like a few weeks ago or maybe like a month ago. Um, I'm, I'm a deist. Uh, I believe you're Christian, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, right on. Yeah. So I, I wanted to uh, touch base with you to see what uh, what your general response would be to um, infinite regression arguments. Uh, and I'm not sure if you want to go in that direction. If you had something else in mind for this live, we could always uh, we could always circle back uh, uh, some other time. Infinite regressions in regards to like a Kalam or something? Well, the Kalam to me generally, right, which is one, one variety of the cosmological argument, uh, as, as or, I presume. Cosmological arguments in general, like infinite regress in regards to cosmological arguments? Uh, correct, yeah, so... Uh, you have a quick question, I'll try to answer it, yeah. I've only got one other guy in the chat, and he just, in the queue, and he just joined, or, and he left, so okay, yeah, until someone else comes up, where it's all you, man, <laughs> ask me what you want. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, no worries at all. Yeah, and uh, somebody in the chat saying, you know, they want disagreements. I mean, I, I, we, we can definitely get into disagreements. Uh, I, I, I could be, I, I could put on my uh, opposition hat and go full, full throttle. But um, yeah, no, so, so the let's, let's, let's be chill for a second. Go ahead and ask your question. <laughs> yes. uh, no, absolutely. Yeah, I, um, I, I think we, we can probably uh, make it more of a fruitful, productive discussion that way. Anyways, um, but yeah, the, you know, the, the typical uh, retort. Um, from for many atheists, right, would be the setting up this juxtaposition between causal finitism, uh, which would be in line with with theism, most theistic positions, right, where there's a, a causal source to the existential states that we experience, that we observe. And I presume that would be your position. You would you would be a causal finitist, meaning that when we go back in time, you would not claim that time goes back infinitely unless unless you have a different take on that yeah that's that's pretty that's pretty roughly yeah um so whether or not time goes back in, infinitely so generally what i used to would have said on that is i would be like yeah i don't think time is past infinite depending on how you, it depends on how you define time here and the reason i'm a little bit um trepidatious is because are you familiar with ryan mullins yeah, I've spoken to him a few times. Uh, he actually made a video response to me claiming that uh, under uh, some conceptions of God, uh, you don't necessarily have to apply uh, a mind in the typical sense. Uh, and he kind of like uh, took offense to that. <laughs> uh, yeah. But so the, the reason I ask is because he has this kind of like provocative view that in a sense God is time. And so I'm still kind of trying to figure out whether or not I think that's neat or whether or not I feel like that's nonsense. So tell you what, for right now, I'm going to go with kind of the view I generally hold, which I'm going to say, yeah, I think time, um, I think time is, is past finite. Yeah, let's go with that for now. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and generally, the, the way that I conceptualize time, I think most philosophers are, or, uh, you know, including uh, w whether they're atheistic or not, would... Um, 
define it as change, right? Uh, an existential state reconfiguring itself into another existential state. Uh, that's the typical definition of time. Um, the more the broader definition would uh, maybe go towards B theory or even C theory of time, which would kind of present uh, existence in this um, block state where the past, present, and future have a simultaneous uh, existence or if not simultaneous, then there's really no, um, there's no special privilege to the present, uh, as opposed to a theory of time, which is the typical, the typical sense that we have when we talk about time. We, we privilege the present and we don't say that the past exists and we don't say that the future exists. The past did exist and no longer exists. The future will exist, but it doesn't exist yet. So under that that's the typical framework in which we consider time. And I think that's the same frame that you're working off of. And uh, it makes most sense to me as far as discussing belief and knowledge, since we contextualize our belief and knowledge in that frame. So we don't have to necessarily go down the line of B theory or C theory of time uh, for the present. But the idea of infinite regress, right, would essentially be this uh, causal infinitism, which is causes uh, inf infinite amount of causal predecessors to the present. Therefore, there is no originating cause, meaning there's no uncaused cause, which would be the, I guess, fundamental definition of God, right? Which would be this um, source that itself is uncaused. Therefore, if you have an infinite regression, you don't need to posit an uncaused cause. Uh, Therefore, God is not necessary and there's no there's no compulsion to believe in God. So I was wondering, like, if somebody presents that argument and there's been countless examples of uh, people trying to um, counter this notion of infinite regress. Mm -hmm. I happen to believe it produces a contradiction and I have an argument for why I think it produces a contradiction. Um, the other route that I usually see people take is that. Uh, on parsimony, causal finitism is just more parsimonious than infinite regress. So it makes more sense to just elect the more parsimonious route, all else being equal. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious to see like um, um, how you would deal with the objection if, if an atheist right, uh, comes along and says like, look, you're positing this causal finitism. I feel that there's no compulsion to hold this belief if we have the, if, if the option of infinite regress is viable. Yeah, um, so my kind of response to that is going to be just kind of the traditional responses you you get. I'm just gonna, I don't think an infinite regress is is viable. I don't think it's reasonable. Um, so as as I know you know, there's a lot of arguments in the philosophical literature against an infinite regress. Let me tell you about the ones that I personally, when I sit and I and I kick my feet up at night, the ones I think hit me the most. So I think arguments about traversing an uh, uh, traversing an infinite by a series of successive addition, like the impossibility of that. Um, I, I find that to be a reason to think that there isn't an infinite regress. I also, um, I think Andrew Loke's argument about, and, I mean, it's not necessarily just Loke's. I mean, he, he gets, it's very reminiscent of like Aquinas of, um, listen, if you have an infinite regress, nothing has any type of causal grounding. So the type of kind of analogy he gives, it says, okay, let's say you and I are in a room and I have no means to get money. I, I have to have, if in, the only way I can get money is if somebody gives me money. I have no way to create it myself. And let's say you're in the room and um, you also, you have no way to get money. Um, you, you can only get money from someone else. No matter how many people we have in that room, if everyone's like that, nobody's gonna start having money. Like it's never gonna be the case that, oh, all of a sudden James, James has money all of a sudden. Like no, like there has to be, um, there has to be someone who does not rely on others to get the money um, and then can kind of give it to others. And so it's the same way when it comes to things beginning to exist. I don't have the ability to begin to exist unless something, you know, kind of gives, it causes me to exist in the sense of like kind of gives me the money. Uh, it kind of gives me the, uh, the existential status or gives me ontological status unless my parents cause me. But they also, they have no ability to begin to exist on their own. They have, they derive their ability to exist on something else. And so if this is just infinitely in the past, this just seems like an example of Loke's infinite debtors. Like we're never, it doesn't make any sense to say I begin to exist if there's no grounding at all for this causal chain. Like that just seems intuitive to me, intuitively to me, um, like correct. Another example that Loke gives of kind of a similar line um, is imagine you had a, a train 
and there was uh, the there's an infinite uh, what are they called carts on the train. Each one of those tarts, carts has no ability to propel itself. It can only be pulled or pushed by another cart. If all of the carts on the train are like that, it doesn't make any sense to say that motion began. Like, there has to be some something that can either, does not have to be pushed or pulled. It can, it can do the pushing, it can get things going itself, um, and so on and so off. So that's kind of what I would say the vicious causal regress argument. I, I just find that intuitively very powerful. Um, I find the infinite uh, not being able to cross um, uh, an actual infinite through the process of successive addition. I find that intuitive. And then you have this kind of causal finitism arguments that guys like Proust and um, what's the other one, Coons use. I think those are, are strong too. I usually don't get into those just because I feel like sometimes when I explain the Grim Reaper paradox, people's eyes just glaze over. Um, Jacob Erasmus. In, in his book, I think I'm pronouncing his name right, he has, um, he kind of goes over some arguments for, um, he goes over some arguments against the infinite causal regress that I've never seen talked about. One of them is like the infinite persistent liar paradox or something like that, which it, it does kind of get you, it, it's a very clear example of this is an instance in which this is coherent until you extend it into the past, and then it's just logically impossible. And so what's going on here? Well, it, it, this se it seems to be that the problem is this idea of it being logically in the past. A while back, I flirted with using that, but then, I don't know, I kind of I kind of didn't want to use an argument that I don't see people talking about a lot in the literature, because I'm like, it must be something that's being missed. But yeah, that's my kind of knee-jerk thought. Uh, that's how I respond. I appreciate that summary, absolutely. And, and I, I've been encountered, I'm presently studying exactly those arguments from press and coons uh, actually dr truth in the comments uh was um uh, generous enough to point out some of his uh favorite clips and articles and papers uh pertaining to precisely the authors you mentioned um i i'm very sympathetic to the successive uh, successive edition uh, problem which i generally call the traversal problem i think you mentioned traversing as well uh which again is this idea where if you start if, if you're already positing infinite regression right you're positing that uh, there's an infinity of causal predecessors uh that have already already uh, elapsed or been traversed however you want to parse it and then if you're commencing at a and going and going from b and saying that you know from a to b there's an infinity that needs to be traversed since that is what infinite regression is claiming right that there's an infinite infinite span that has already been traversed or elapsed even though there's uh atheists who will try to kind of get around this with um discussion of dense time i don't know if you've heard of the uh, notion of dense time right which is this kind of like packing within within a finite span or or conceptually uh distinguishing dense time from infinite time which i don't think actually works because you, you still run into the same traversal problem um then there's also this like idea of like the patchwork principle which is this overlapping uh or or I'm not 100% sure exactly how the patchwork principle uh, works in addressing infinite regress, but it, from what I understand, it still doesn't get around the traversal issue, right? Where you have uh, A to B, uh, but infinity, right, is as big as as big as as you want the number to be. So if you're progressing from A to B, let's say you progress 10 minutes and then you add. 10 minutes to B and B is 10 minutes further away and you can return back to A and then repeat that forever, right? And you'll, you, you can always keep adding in succession B being further away the amount that you've now traversed from A to B. So you will never actually consummate the infinity and you reach the contradiction, right? Which is the uh, claim that B exists, but yet B never does it, never comes into existence. So you get your P and not P uh, via this traversal problem. And I've, I've never actually come across um, a successful refutation of this, despite uh, the efforts of distinguishing dense time from um infinite time and uh, patchwork principles so um so yeah definitely but one idea i thought is perhaps if somebody claims that if 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 god if the notion of god is uncaused is kind of applied to this idea of infinite regress where this uncaused state is split uh infinitely into 
an infinite amount of causal states, right? So we take the concept of the uncaused of God, right? And split it into an infinity of uncaused states and apply that to an infinite regression to see if we can kind of get around the notion of, or get around the problem of having a first initiation or a prime mover. Um, have you come across something, something along those lines, or do you think that that's kind of like incoherent since itself, uh, it, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't really explain how this regression would even, um, um, come about in the first place. Yeah. So I'm not sure that I understand how that makes sense on first pass. And then kind of the thing that's lurking in my mind when you say, um, you know, what if we kind of take this one, this one cause and we <clears throat> split it into an infinite mini, like, well, doesn't that just violate Occam's razor? Shouldn't we be trying to shave away, um, all of these, all these kind of other causes shouldn't the, the explanation that posits the most, or excuse me, uh, the explanation that posits the least amount of causes, isn't that the most parsimonious one? And so if it explains the data, we should go with it. I agree. I think on parsimony, even if you take away the, um, the, the, the logical issues, the traversal problem, um, I think on parsimony, causal finitism still wins out, uh, just based off of like a standard, uh, array of theoretical virtues. Um, I mean, I, I'm not presenting that argument per se here, but that's definitely one, one other route. I, I think for me, the top arguments against infinite regress would be precisely this, uh, well, the three things uh, that, that we've discussed so far, parsimony, uh, the traversal problem, i.e. successive addition, and then the um, failure for, uh, failure for, for causal um, impartment as far as the, I think the train example that you gave is, is, is a nice illustration of that. So have you read Loke's book, uh, the teleological and Kalam cosmological arguments we visited? No, I haven't actually. I'm going to write that down because I'm, it's I'm, I'm free trying on Amazon. Loke's book. Okay. Yeah. He just gives it away for free. The Kindle version is free. Um, yeah, I pulled it up to make sure before I told you that it came out in 2022. So it's really recent and it's free. And I think it's probably the most up to date, like monograph on this topic. And he deals with a lot of the objections that are in the literature. Um, so if this is this, I think that would probably be a good area for you to go to, um, because that that's where he presents his arguments and stuff that we were just talking about, and then also like it, it's just a really up to date response by a theist who engages with you know guys like Malpass and Sobol and Oppie and all of them. Absolutely, yeah, I will definitely check that out. I wasn't aware of that uh, of that on yeah, Amazon, and if it's free, it's even better. Yeah, L-O-K-E. For those who, uh, someone was asking in the chat, how do you spell that? It's Andrew, like Andrew, and then L-O-K-E. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Bart, That's... I have a guy in the chat who wants to come up, so I think I'm going to let him come up and let you yeah, go. Sure. Yeah, I enjoy talking to you. This is a uh, good, good break. Let's see if Free Naturalist is going <laughs> to... I appreciate gonna... it, yeah. Great uh, great chat. Appreciate you, Philosopher's Garb, and I'll see you soon. Thanks, man. Take, take, it, take it easy. Oof, can't even talk. <laughs> no worries. All right, I'm about to bring you up, uh, free naturalist. Uh, oh wait, um, Dingo, I think Dingo was in the, uh, I think Dingo was in the queue before you, free naturalist. So I'm gonna bring him up real quick since uh, he was waiting earlier. I knew he he hopped on earlier, then I think he hopped off. So I'm gonna give him a chance real quick since I know he's been waiting. Yo, what's good? What's up, man? How's it going? I'm doing good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. What's on your mind, friend? Um, so essentially, um, uh, firstly, I enjoy your content as an atheist because I like seeing the arguments presented like for Christianity because a lot of the time it's just LPT being pushed against uh, Christians and they just don't know how to defend it. So like, it's nice seeing the content. Um, but no, I was just listening to your discussion and I tapped out before because my food arrived and like I have my priorities, but I was listening to your conversation. Um, I don't understand why infinite traversal poses a problem as long as we can like discern a structure, which I, we can do like mathematically, I can discern a structure with infinite space between intervals and an infinite distance in terms of cardinality. And then just a simple subscription to like the B theory of time kind of circumvents this requirement for traversal. Yeah, so I don't think that um, a B theory of time gets you gets you a whole lot. So someone like Craig, when he initially started doing his columns, he said, yeah, I think you can, I think you can uh, maybe throw a wrench in all this by being a proponent of B theory of time. But then other philosophers came in and they were like, yeah, no, let's, let's not say that. And so guys like Loke and Proust have created columns that are completely independent. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, Alexander Proust himself 
holds to a, a B theory of time. Um, but then also, I mean, just me personally, I think a, a B theory of time is completely counterintuitive. So I don't see why we would we would hold to something like that. <laughs> So I'm obviously not familiar with like any contemporary arguments that I've like revisited or like revised the the Coulomb cosmo cosmological argument because like normally B theory and then like simple mathematical description provides enough, but I guess I'm yes. missing something. Yeah. yeah. So then when it comes to the the topic of successive addition of one having to occur after the other, so do you object the idea that a, a process of one at a time successive addition? you could ever traverse an actual infinite like that task could be completed oh so like a precursor that occurs objectively prior to the like the the effect yeah so if let's say i start the process of um trying to tra traverse an actual infinite through this process of one at a time successive addition um yeah. do you think that that process could ever be done you'd always end up on the penultimate one so no yeah so then that seems then like that seems to go because before you were saying seemed to be saying that you thought we could traverse an actual infinite. So it seems like now you you're on board with saying yeah, traversing an actual no, infinite isn't a thing. I'm on board with like when you have like the saying a set of real numbers, like you're never going to traverse it. You're never going to go from one to two, right? Um, but my I'm like circumventing like the requirement for traversal when I say each event is equally real, no matter how far sparse these time events are. Okay, so so but then even in a B theory of time, so you want to say that um, uh, uh, you're taking a B theory of time and you want to say, okay, well, listen, five AD is not uh, five AD is before you know four AD, but five AD is um, uh, you know objectively real, so therefore we don't have this traversal of an actual infinite or something like that. Yeah, so like with your example for about asking for money. I would mm -hmm. say as long as it's real within the temporal domain that you have money, then no matter how far you want to go back, you're going to have that money at this specific time, like a specific uh, section, I'll say, on the temporal domain. But then it seems like, how did I get that money if no one in the chain was able to, to cause it to come about? Yeah, because that's like uh, relying upon like the idea of traversing from one event to event, three event. Whereas what I'm saying is the final event, the event following the penultimate event of you having the money is always real. I'm not, cause like when we say like handing money to each other, we look at it as like a, an exchange of time. It takes me two seconds to get the money out, find the cash, give it to you. And then that goes on. So let me ask you a question then. Um, you come home one evening, you open up your door. I don't know if you live in an apartment or a, a house. Let's say you live in a house. Um, you come home, you open your door and then you just see a, a horse that's just in the middle of your room and unfortunately it's defecated on the carpet do you think that that horse just appeared there at, at some point in time and and or do you do you start looking for broken windows do you start looking do you start calling up your friends and saying okay which one of you guys did this you know something like that do you look for um, some type of precursor that led way to that or you just say well uh, i guess in the grand cosmic chain that's already or always existed at you know, this specific time, this horse, for some reason, has just always existed here, but never in anything preceding that. Therefore, it, it requires no explanation. Yeah, so just before I answer, because I don't want to, like, just give a yes or no and just mess myself up here. I wanna make, I'd make a distinction here, because obviously I'd look for where the horse had come in, because I'd make it, like, I would say the vent of it being in my house and being outside my house, say, the day before, they exist in parity. But the spatial domain, which it had to move through, I would say that's where I'd, like, that's where I'd look for the movement. Okay, so if you're looking for the movement there, if you're recognizing like, hey, it doesn't make sense for this for this just to occur here with no causal, you know, kind of no grounding in, in the causal chain that preceded it, it seems like that's all I need to be like, okay, yeah, same thing with me. Like, there has to be there has to be something that causally grounds um, me coming into existence, and that requires there to be something at the beginning of this causal chain that itself doesn't rely on anything for existence. It, it doesn't get caused by anything else. Like, I don't yeah, think so, to the B okay. theory of time, I mean, I have philosophical issues with the B theory of time, but I think when it comes to these type of like causal grounding arguments, I don't think appealing to a B theory gets you anywhere because it's still the case that whatever goes on at, you know, 2020 um, AD, that still has to have causal grounding. Yeah, so we're like I feel like we're still falling into this um this chain of 
Sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. We fell off falling into like a chain of something requiring a foundation to have reached a progression, like a temporal chain. So if I have like a temporal chain event A through B, we're saying A, B, A has to occur before B. So until A occurs, B can't occur. But when I'm talking about this real objective temporal domain, event B is just as real as event A. So they, they happen, I guess, in parity and simultaneity. So there's no requirement for like the traversal backwards. All you have is the the spatial like traversal. So do you do you think what's your argument for the B theory of time then? Since um, so I, I'm kind of I'm kind of playing here with um, trying to argue why I don't think the B theory of time is is going to get you out of anything. But I I kind of just want to be lazy and say okay like why should we hold to the B theory of time because it's recognized by pretty much everyone as being counterintuitive to how we usually experience time. Yeah no you're good I'm not. Um, particularly philosoph like particularly philosophically adept, but I do study physics, so I'd like um, kind of appeal to that area of study and say the B theory of time would be more in line with like contemporary theoretics. Well, I, I think that that's mistaken. Um, so someone like Einstein with his general and special theory of relativity, um, something like that assumes a B theory of time. However, his work has been rightly critiqued. Um, because he essentially assumes a B theory of time to argue for a B theory of time. He, he uh, assumes um, certain assumptions that end up just being circular and that there are models of special relativity which do have a, 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 a privileged reference frame, right? Like that's the term that gets used. Um, so there are like um, Lorentzian models of special relativity that they preserve all the data that needs to be explained, but they also preserve our intuitive um, experiences of the passage of time. And so it seems to me like that would be better because it not only explains the physical data, but it also meshes better with how we, how we experience the world. Yeah, so I get what you're saying because, like, I do know it's like common when people like mention physics to appeal to like relativity simply to say um, that, as you said before, there is no privileged frame of reference. Like, you have an inertial frame of reference where what you observe is like per the temporal domain different to what somebody else is elsewhere observing, like simultaneously. Um, but that's not particularly where I, where I take it. Although I would say it's a decent a decent position. But um, when I'm talking about theoretics, I'm talking like things about like personal subscriptions of mine, like brain cosmology and like the ADD model. These are all things that require a fourth, fifth, like, et cetera, I mentioned where they treat the fourth as a static block. So these are the things I'd hold to. And I'd argue that these are my arguments for cosmological existence. Thus, these are the arguments I'd say I require a static temporal domain for. Okay. So can you give me some of those arguments then for the uh, static domain? So these are arguments that you think, these are reasons that you think constitute uh, a B theory of time. Oh, yeah. So and brain so cosmology is... Audience, B theory of time, because I realize sometimes people may not know what we're talking about. B theory of time is this idea that he's already described. Like, all the times, in a sense, kind of exist. Um, like, the past is just as real as the present, which is just as real as the future. What's different is just kind of the um, subjective... The, the subjective kind of um, experience of the person in it. It seems like now, it seems like... Uh, uh, 2024 is what's real to me. Well, the guy who's at 10 BC, it, it seems like 10 BC is real to him. And one of these is not more right than the other. This is just the difference between us is like the difference between a guy standing on the left side of a room and a guy standing on the right side of the room. Like they're both equally real. Um, it's just kind of a different position in the room. He's saying, um, uh, Dingo is saying that he holds to a model of time in which um, the future is in the past are, are in a sense just people standing on different sides of the room. I hope that that's, I, I try to just sum that up really, really basically there for people who are like, what is this B theory of time stuff? But with that said, go ahead and, and put forth your thoughts, uh, uh, Dingo. Yeah, so one thing, because obviously as an atheist, I get a questioned a lot of a precursor to the Big Bang, what, what could have happened? Um, and I normally hold to brain cosmology, like I'm sure like, even, I don't, I don't know what, like, I know you're very intel intelligent, but I don't know, like, where you are with, like, science and stuff, but I'm assuming, like, string theory is something you've heard of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it's like an extension of M theory, so, like, a unified string theory, and we call it brain theory, where, like, we say that universe is embedded, it's a 4D, like, block embedded in, in a brain, say, embedded in, like, a higher dimensional space, and that's how we account for inflation, that's how we account for gravity. That gets real complicated getting into that, but we treat this 4D space as three plus one dimensions um, where the latter, the one dimension is the time to pro domain. And it is no, as we said before, privileged uh, frame of reference, I'll say, within this domain because it's simply a result of an embedding in a higher dimension. 
Like there is no, it's like a static block within a higher dimension. Okay, so so is your, are you saying that this is an aspect of this theory and you adopt this theory? Um, and, and that's why you hold the B theory? Because what I'm asking is like, okay, so why should I, why should I adopt that, you know, that view? I mean, there's, there's a lot of different views among, you know, uh, quantum mechanics, relativity, try, trying to, you know, unifying theories of everything. Um, if you have one that has this kind of static block and the, you know, the higher, uh, you know, plane, whatever, why should we hold to that one given how counterintuitive it, counterintuitive it is about time? Like, is there, is there some set of data that triumphs this over uh, an alternative um, explanation or an alternative model? So my thought, I misapprehended what you uh, asked in the beginning. Um, I would not, I would not say that I have um, a position of superiority here. I just have subscription, as like we all do. Um, so when it comes, to, I, I could argue that this theory is more in line. Like we have a method, or we're attempting to work on a method better than others for like explaining quantum gravity, etc. So these would be indicators for me as to why it's like a uh, more worthy I guess of subscription but I would not say it is a position where like I'm in superiority for holding it therefore you must hold it yeah but there are but there are other positions that um, <clears throat> they it's not as if uh, those who hold to something like this are the only ones who are offering explanations or models for things like quantum gravity right no, that's why I avoid that's why I avoid saying that I have like a superior view that you must you must follow through with but I'm saying like in the instance that I do subscribe to this and this entails B theoretics, I, I like that's how I use these arguments to then say, well, this is my subscription. I see no problem with infinite regress emanating yeah. from this. Yeah. Okay. So then a couple thoughts there. Um, I actually have a, okay. So I have, I have several thoughts here. Okay. That's good. I understand better. So here's my, um, my thought about a theory versus B theory, stuff like that is um, if we have two models, A and B, and these, in the, I shouldn't have used anything. If we have X and Y, because I don't want to get confused with models of time. Uh, if we, let's say we're looking at stuff like string theory, um, you know, M theory, stuff like that. So we have these different competing theories of explaining the universe, physics, everything, right? Um, quantum mechanics, all that. And we have, uh, let's say, theory X and we have theory Y. Theory X and theory Y are both equal when it comes to um, explaining the, the physical data that we have. So when it comes to, you know, like the data on the table that we have to make sense of, let's say they're, um, they're equivalent on that front. If it's the case that oh, X and Y are both, you know, uh, neither one is superior to the other when it comes to explaining the data we have. And, you know, one is not just like, we ha has some really damning like uh, 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 theoretical vice or something like that, you know, like this theoretical theoretical uh, virtues and stuff like that. Let's say like they're for the most part, um, you know, on, on the same playing field when it comes to these uh, general like goals we apply for um, theory evaluation. If X preserves our intuitions, like kind of the just kind of, I hate to use this word, these kind of common sense intuitions about how time operates and why posits something completely counterintuitive. If they're equal on everything else when it comes to, you know, like explanatory power, doesn't it seem reasonable to just go with the one that utilizes our intuitive experiences of the world? So like um, our more intricate deta intricately detailed idea of Occam's razor? Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, so that's similar. I guess my thing is like, why are we throwing out our, our intuitive experience of time like willy nilly? Like it seems to me like if I can, if, if the theory that you hold to that has a very counterintuitive time, ex, uh, uh, explanation of time and all that, if my theory can do all the same things and it keeps how it seems like time operates to me, that seems to me like, why aren't we all just, why, why would we go to your theory? Yeah, so well, essentially I would also like, this would be like a completely external thing. I would affirm Occam's razor in many senses, but I don't think an argument from intuition leads to anything like substantial to myself. I, I would argue that intuition doesn't lead to absolutes or objectivities, anything as such. So I have no reason to like favor something over it or favor but that so over something. Else. When you, when you reflect on your life, like just, just reflect on your experiences, right? You've probably had a time in your life where you're like, Oh, are you in school or have you been in school in the past? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So let's uh, let's say that you've you've been in school in the past, um, or maybe you're still not. Um, let's say you're like, oh man, I got this test. I got this test coming up on Friday. Ugh, I'm really dreading it. And then the the time approaches, your dread increases, and then you have the test, and you're either there and you're trepidatious, and then afterwards you're like, 
whew, I'm glad that's done, right? Like your experience, when you just reflect on how you've experienced the world, it seems like there was temporal becoming. Like just your experience of the world, like your, your, your intuitions, your experience, what it seems to you like is that that was in the future, you were dreading it, it happened, now it's in the past, thank God that it's done, right? Like, I mean, I know you're not, I know you don't believe in God, that's a joke. Uh, like, if, if thank the heavens or whatever, that that is now done, it's in the past, it's not a thing anymore. Like, that's just how you experience the world, like, that's how we tend to think. And it's, that's that's as as uh, as obvious to me as, like, the fact that there's, like, a box in front of me or, like, my computer in front of me. Like, it seems to me, like, there is temporal becoming and passing of time in this a theory sense. Like, that's just as intuitive as as it seems to me, like, that there's a computer in front of me. So it, it, it's extremely odd to me that you would adopt this view that would have you jettison that if there's no like reason for yeah. it. So if we had these two models and we're going to differentiate between them, I don't think, cause like, unless we can affirm some level of reliabilism, such that like my senses, my intuition, these things are in fact reliable, I wouldn't see how I could I, I use it as a metric to discern which models um, are favorable over the other. And I would say that your intuition can be wrong in like many senses and that like i would demonstrate that through previous like the epr paradox of einstein where he said well there must be um there must be like hidden variables encoded within within particles that tell us how they're going to act in the future right they don't just happen to act like uh light distances apart and act simultaneously right yeah. but we now know hmm? i sorry i didn't want to interrupt you um i didn't i didn't did you make your point i didn't i didn't know if you were going to get to the point um I didn't know if you were building something. I didn't want to interrupt you before, but I did want to kind of narrow down on that idea of it seemed like, um, and you can refresh me here, it seemed like you said something along the lines of um, I would need, I don't have anything to kind of support these intuitions or this, you know, the seeming about how the the passage of time works. I don't have anything that kind of I can use to, to verify that. Was it, is it something along those lines? Yeah, so like reliabilism, really. There is like reliabilism is an infallible or a fallible position. Like there, we can't hold it to mean anything. So I would read like dismiss it as a metric for like discerning between structures or models. Okay, but all of your experiences are in a sense come from your just direct your direct seemings of the world, and anything you appeal to in science, in, in model building, and in, in the equations, you know, that you just reference, that all assumes that your experiences that you can trust your experiences of the world or at least that they have kind of a prima facie justification that they're innocent until proven guilty because if you have to verify your experiences we're just all like just we're, we're all in court and uh, descartes cartesian nightmare right where it's like well it seems to me like there's a box in front of me but i can't give an argument for that because then i'm just experiencing i'm just appealing to other experiences and i have to give an argument for them and you know, I, I can't really get anywhere um, so it seems like we have to adopt a type of like, it seems to me that this is the case. And in the absence of a defeater, I'm justified in, um, going with my seemings until I'm given a reason not to. Do you see what I'm saying here? Yeah, I see, I see what you're saying, but like, I, I would still affirm it in my sense of holding to empiricism, right? That, um, it's relative to the axioms employed, right? And what we know, know in quotations, I'll say, is relative to the axioms employed. I'm, I'm a global relativist. So intuition would like using intuition as a metric and then using empiricism as a metric um, or theoretics as a metric, I don't see like a way to discern one over the other saying intuition is how I experience things and I favor that over something that so, seems again. Sorry, go on. Even as an empiricist, like the thing I'm offering is not contrary to empiricism, like necessarily, or, or an empirical approach to the world. Like, you can't have empiricism unless you're trusting your experiences or your, your seemings. I said in, into intuitions earlier, I probably should use something more like seemings or, or, um, or experiences. Because any, if you sit down and say, okay, I have this data, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reason myself something out here. Well, you're still using seemings. You're seeming, uh, you're using these kind of noetic seemings about like what seems to, uh, be rationally inferred from the other, what is entailed by the other. These are all seemings. You're implying, um, you're using your memory. You say, okay, I did this experiment, I did that experiment. Um, well, that assumes that your memory about those past experiences, that it seems to you like you, you did that, that that's actually, um, that that's actually trustworthy. So just in general, like I'm, I'm not saying that like we can't, we, we just have to like close our eyes and put our fingers in our ears and just fly by the seat of our pants and just based on intuitions or, or seemings alone. But the point I'm, I'm making here is I think 
apart from A theory of time, B theory of time, and this is something that comes up a lot on my chats, is when it comes to how things seem to us or our experiences, I think we have to adopt an epistemology of something like what it's been called um, phenomenological conservatism, which is just that if it seems to you like something is the case, you're justified in believing that until you have a defeater. So you're justified in believing that there's an external world, you're justified in, in trusting your memories, you're, you're, you're justified in all that. And I think you have to have that as a, as a kind of a background before you can kind of start doing these um, more complicated things of doing experiments and building models, because all of those are themselves built on these kind of other, these other seemings. And if that makes sense to you, and if you say, okay, like, yeah, I see where you're coming from here, and maybe you don't, and you can object in a second, um, then what I'm going to say is like, okay, one of these seemings that pretty much we all have is a theory of time. Like, that's one of these seemings. And so that should, that seems like as important to incorporate into our models as, you know, the reality of the external world or something like that. You see what I'm getting at here? Yes. Yeah. So my point there, like, I feel like we're kind of moving towards the same page here. I wouldn't agree fully is that what we affirm, what we observe is completely relative, like, uh, like, unless you want to like an inductionalist argument or empiricism, anything like this, it's relative to like, as you said, like the epistemological foundation, like applied, right? So is that where you got? Yeah. So when I'm, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So if I have two things and under a diff, like if I just adopt or a different axiomatic foundation, I'm going to find a completely different result. Um, and like that can be obviously demonstrated with a parallel postulate that doesn't work on like hyperbolic surfaces. Um, so it's relative to what you affirm to get to that foundation. So when you affirm, like, uh, as you said, like a, observation as a metric for saying I prefer, prefer this model over the other whereas I don't see like a difference in me saying I'm going to affirm theoretics that don't apply intuition for this model because I don't think like the theoretics always entails or sorry perception or experience I don't think theoretics always entail experience or ensue from experience okay so how do you get from your, your theoretics about um, b theory time a theory time stuff like that Part, part of your theoretics there is going to deal with incorporating scientific data from physics, right? Yes. Okay, and, and it's also going to incorporate like theoretical virtues of like, okay, what seems the most parsim parsimonious and less ad hoc and you know, all, all, that, all that good stuff. So how do you form a, um, <clears throat> how do you incorporate that into a metric that is not reliant on some form of experience or seeming? Okay, so when, when, when we say experience, that like encompassing um, like uh, predictions, et cetera, like affirmed predictions, so you predict something, you observe it, and you say that's true. Now I can like inductionally affirm this for future cases, like, right? That kind of thing? So I'm just saying, like, how, how do you get your, like, I, I'm using um, experience to mean just like it, it seems to you to be the case. So, like, if I, if I pinch my hand, like, there's, there's a seeming there of pain, or like, if I turn and I see something green, there's like, you know, if you're into a philosophy of mind, there's the qualia of, you know, green. Um, so like these are experiences or, or you know, like I, I, it seems to me like I, I ate breakfast this morning. Um, like that, yeah, that seems like something I did. It seems like I have memory of that. So are you saying that you can build a metric of a, a B theory of time that, that supports B theory of time? Are you saying you can or incorporates all this physical data? You can do that without appealing or without it being reliant on these seemings because that seems to be what you were getting at no pun intended <laughs> no, you're good but wouldn't wouldn't theoretics like entail that it's not required on like experience or seeming theoretics is purely like uh, deductional like proofs okay so but it, you said your theoretics were going to incorporate the scientific data right um, when I said like scientific data, I'd refer in this like in a specific case I would bring up it would be like the Einstein field equations, which you can take to produce non-intuition -intu like driven conclusions, I guess. Okay, so so let's so you're not actually incorporating any like data that comes from like a lab or or you know sitting there with dropping dropping feathers and bowling balls off roof. You're not you're not using any type of observable data for your construction. You're just kind of going off of base like mathematical models and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, sure. So just like for the sake of discussion, like what works theoretically, I'd have no problem with like holding it as possible. Okay. So, okay. So then even if you're doing that, even if you're constructing a model, which uses this type of 
um, you know, mathematical or, or philosophical reasoning, and you're just completely devoid, you just completely don't even need to uh, talk about, um, you know, empirical things, that's still going to rely on seemings. That's going to rely on what seems to be um, rash one one thing is rationally entailed by the other, or one thing is is uh, conducive to the other. You're still relying on seemings. Like you're still relying on okay, well this seems intuitively contradictory to this other thing. Like even if you sit down and you close your eyes and you try to construct a model that doesn't reference anything in the outside world, you're still going to be relying on your seemings. And then I'm still going to come back and be like, okay, so you do admit that we have to rely on our seemings, and these are things that to to avoid uh, to avoid just a Cartesian nightmare. Like we have to grant them innocent until proven guilty status. Do you see what I'm getting at here? I I don't. I think I'm like it's fully on me. I'm like it's 4 a.m. here. I'm failing to follow what you just said completely. Okay. Yeah. Um. I think here here's the here's the 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 thing I'm getting at. Um, anything you any way you reason about the world, any way that you, you know, construct a model of special relativity and any way you try to you know conceptualize space time and, and you try to do this in a way that's uh, not just us reading tea leaves, right? Like it's, not, it's like not just us like pulling stuff out of our butt. Like we're trying to actually be rational about it and, and take into account uh, empirical data. All of that is going to assume that you can trust your, your seemings. You can trust your experiences. Even if you're just closing your eyes and say, I'm going to be like Descartes, I'm just going to close my eyes, put my fingers in my ear, I'm not even going to think that the external world exists, I'm not going to use any empirical data. I'm just going to try to figure things out just like, you know, up here in my mind. You're still relying on how things seem to you. You're still relying on your certain intuitions. And so if you, so you have to grant, unless you just want to be just in the realm of Cartesian skepticism about everything, you have to grant that our seemings, our experiences, intuitions, things like that, they have innocent until proven guilty status. Because if you don't grant that, no, none of us are getting anywhere. Like, we can't even get this game going. You know what I mean? We can't even get science going in, unless we grant that, okay, like, experiences are innocent until proven guilty. So I would adopt the position of skepticism, like anti-realism, these things. I, like, I, I'm assuming you've heard it many times, like Descartes' famous saying, you just re re modify it and just say, I think, therefore, I'm certain I am. Like that's as far as I'd ever take that statement. Um, to, but to what's again? To... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I know. You, I was just going to say that I still see like the statement of me affirming like what I see as an experience to be like a metric for discerning models, etc. Even if the models are reliant upon inductional arguments that this has pragmatically worked in the past, I'm going to assume it works in the future. These kind of things. I don't see superiority in one just because one holds to a metric that isn't objective, like it's an objective relative to some affirmed reliabilism, right? Yeah, I, I, so here's my fear. I think that we might continue to go in circles if we belabor this point. So tell you what I want to do. Um, I do. I do have some people in the chat, but before I do that, I kind of want to go back. So up to this point, um, to kind of summarize what we've talked about, you said, okay, hey, I think I can avoid some of these arguments against an infinite regress if I say B theory of time. And I said, why B theory of time? And so we've kind of been we've kind of been going back and forth about you know A versus B theory of time. So now I want to go back and I, I want to say, hey, listen, um, I don't think let's say I grant B theory of time. Um, that may get you out of some type of like temporal regress argument, but I still think you're going to have a, another argument, which I didn't mention earlier, which is I think that we should think that it's impossible for um, there to be an actual infinite uh, of a concrete reality. So this is a type of uh, argument that guys like Andrew Loke uses it, Craig made it really popular, of uh, this idea of you cannot have an actual infinite amount of something or a, qu a quantitative infinite that's in reality. And so um, examples of this, have, have you heard of like Hilbert's Hotel and stuff like that probably? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so things like that. So if you want to say, okay, past, the past is infinite and, um, you know, and all times are equally present. I'm going to say, it looks to me like you've got a concrete actual infinite. And that seems bonkers. So I think that's yeah. something. I for you, I will like sum this up and then you can respond real quick and then you can have other guests. I'll hop off. Um, but no, I, I've definitely battled with that before with the idea that although it's like syntactically correct when I put it in a mathematical expression, is it going to actualize in reality? There's no like objective way to say that you can take from math to, to reality. All right. Um, so that's definitely one position I've thought about and battled with before. I can't say I have a complete argument about how it 
actualizes. I just don't see an argument against the album Nas just saying it syntactically works. There's no reason to believe it actually works. Um, so I wouldn't see that as like an, an argument that just completely defeats B theory of time, but it's definitely something that I need to battle with, uh, battle with further. B theory of time. I want to be really clear. I think it defeats a B theory of time that incorporates an actual infinite regress. Because there are B theorists of time like Alexander Proust, who he's like, yeah, I'm a B theorist. I don't think there's an infinite regress, so he doesn't have this problem. I just want to make clear so like you don't. I don't want anyone to think like I'm saying, oh, like this defeats B theory of time. Like there's lots of people who would like hang me if I if I said that, uh, or they would try to. But yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Go ahead, sorry. You know, my fault. I would say the same thing. I, I will re re uh, recant that statement and then reformulate it and say I don't think it's an objection to an actual manifestation of infinity. It's just this idea that it, sent it syntactically works by having it in a mathematical expression. This isn't to say that although I can't conceptualize it, it won't exist in reality. Yeah. Um, tell you what, I'm, I'm down to let you have the last word on that if you want, and then I can uh, bring somebody else up. Because I've enjoyed talking with you, and I feel like we could keep going for a while. Um, and I do have some people pulling up in the chat, but I'm down to let you have the last word on that point if you want. Well, I don't really have anything more to say other than I quickly divert from the point and say, love the content, going to keep watching because I love learning arguments for Christianity because it seems to be the hardest one to defend for most people. So it's nice seeing it happen. Thanks. I, I'm glad that there are people out, you know, I worry about sometimes my, or the people who only enjoy my content are just kind of in an echo chamber. And so it's nice to know that even people from outside the, uh, outside the tradition can get some enjoyment from it. Even if they don't agree with it, they can at least uh, find it interesting. So thanks. I appreciate that. Oh, good. Thank you for the combo. Yeah, dude. Take care. I enjoyed it. All right. I'm going to get maybe a few more people up here. I've been going for a hot minute. My phone's going to die on me if I, if I keep going forever. Um, Free Naturalist has been in the chat for a bit. I'm going to bring him up and then uh, we'll go from there. Oops. Here we go. Free Naturalist, what's up, my friend? Hey, what's up, man? Um, uh, uh, I, I did want to um, talk about um, uh, a necessary boom. I'm, not, I'm, I'm probably not as smart as uh, Dingo. <laughs> But but um, I I I do want to um, ask about um, you were talking about a necessary boom, and I I, I understand that you can have a, a necessary boom that is external of all contingent things, and uh, uh, my question is 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 from from. The necessary being's perspective, from God's perspective, does he, does he say that he knows the past, present, and future simultaneously? Um, so who you ask that is gonna um it's gonna depend on what answer you get. Um so let me let me explain that a little bit. Um, so man, there's several ways this could go. So let me let me kind of sprout a, a few different things that are coming to my mind here. So there are some people who think that God is completely timeless. So the necessary being, um, let's, let's call him God, right? There are some people who think God is he exists completely outside of time. So he has he 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 passes through time. He changes in in no in no way whatsoever. That's not a position I hold to. Um, Someone who's who's done a lot of work critiquing that idea, who is himself a Christian theist, is Ryan Mullins. Um, he has a book, End of the Timeless God, in which he gets some, into some of the really nitty gritty details of that. So some some people might say, "Hey, God's completely timeless," and they would say, "God has um, you know kind of perfect, complete knowledge of the past, the present, and the future, all all simultaneously, and and nothing about that ever changes." Other people yeah. might say, "No, God, um, God's in time. God passes through time, and the things that God believes." change because so for instance if god's in time god knows right now that it is uh january 3rd, 31st he didn't know that two days ago mm -hmm. because it wasn't true two days ago so there is some you know kind of change in, in what god knows on on that front and then you have people yeah. like who are open theists who there say um listen god doesn't have knowledge about things about all things that are going to happen in the future um, so an open theist would say, hey, listen, God has, you know, perfect knowledge of the past, perfect knowledge of the present, and he has, mm -hmm. he, he knows a lot about what's going to happen in the future. He may not have perfect knowledge about, you know, maybe some of the things he's going to do, but they may say that God does not know, have exhaustive foreknowledge of every single thing that every single person will do. Uh, and so they would just say there are some things that God, in a sense, God learns some things in that regard. 
And people take that position for one of two main reasons. One is because they think that there's something incompatible with God foreknowing an action and it being free, or it, mm -hmm. so that would be like a philosophical consideration. Or even then, so that's actually there's two philosophical considerations. Sorry, I'm, I'm almost done with this explanation. I know I'm rambling. Um, so one explanation is say, okay, listen, it can't be free and God know it. So maybe they see that as an out. The second philosophical explanation might be, listen, from a philo maybe they think for certain metaphysical philosophical reasons that propositions about what are going to happen, they just don't have a truth value until those things happen. Mm -hmm. So maybe they just say like, it's impossible for anybody to know what's going to happen in the future because those are like, but essentially unknowable things or it may be that they, right. they look at the biblical data and they're like i don't know it seems like god doesn't know some things seems like he changes his mind and so they go forth from that point so all that to put a bow on it um to answer your question is it kind of just depends on who you ask me personally uh like i said i i don't hold to a timelessness with god I, i'm sympathetic to open theism i wouldn't call myself that yet but um i, I wouldn't have too much of a problem so 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 you believe that God is within time, and 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 they don't think that. Do you believe that God knows the future? Um. So so that comes down to the open theism question. I'm kind of just like, eh. I think um, for for I mean, most. I mean, I mean, yeah. But uh, but from from your perspective as a Christian, I mean, if you say that God is all knowing, I mean, uh, I, I I I mean, I would I would. My first thought would be like God knows what's going to happen in the future because you know he, he's the only one who knows the hour, right? He knows when the the last days is going to happen. Does you agree with that? Yeah. Um. So so again, I don't I don't consider myself an open theist. I just have some sympathies there. <laughs> I, I think I consider, I, I generally, when I do theology, I operate under the framework that God knows everything, that he knows all future things. Mm -hmm. And I operate under that framework for two reasons. One is because I know that most other Christians operate under that framework, and I want my work to be applicable to them. And two, just frankly, is it's, it's harder to answer some philosophical or some theological questions. It's more difficult to answer them mm -hmm. if you think God has divine foreknowledge. And so I, mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to do my theology in the hard way. And then if it turns out that I'm wrong about this thing, I'm like, OK, like my answer still works. It doesn't work the other way around. If I if I'm open theist and I give these kind of easy answers to some things and it turns out I'm wrong, well, then like, OK, I, I kind of have to give these answers again. I have to work through this again. So it's like I'm doing I'm going to do it the hard way. And then that way, if it turns out I, I just did it the hard way for no reason, I was like, OK, well, I just made it a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Does that kind of make sense to you? Um, so I, I think God knows when Jesus is coming back. I think God knows the things that he's going to do for us regarding salvation. Um, but in, mm -hmm. an open theist, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, kind of give their position. They would say, like, God knows he's going to do some of these things because they're what he's mm -hmm. going to do. Like he's, just, he's made those decisions about what he's going to do. Um, and so he mm -hmm. knows he's going to do them. But so why God might know that he's going to um, perfect and um, you know, bring to salvation all who, who come to know Christ, all who put their faith in Christ. They may say, God knows he's gonna do that, but he doesn't know who all is gonna be kind of in that group of people who come to have saving faith in Christ. You see what, I'm, see what they might say there? Yeah, yeah I, I fully understand you. It's just, it's just uh, I, I, I can't help but, but, but think that God, because if we're talking about a, a necessity that is, um, <clears throat> that is required for all states of affairs, for the set of all contingent things, then it, 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 it would log it's for me, I would say that it would logically follow that he must know all states of affairs. So he must know the future, he must know the past, especially if we're talking about an, uh, an infinite being that is external from the set of all consensus things. So it makes a lot of sense for someone to posit the idea that 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 God is a being that knows the future. And if that's the case, then I can see how the beauty of time was 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 worked with from God from from God's perspective. Is that what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, what's your? Are you are are you a theist? Are you a Christian? Where do you where do you stand? Uh, uh I'm an atheist. Okay, gotcha. Um, so here's what I, here's what I think about um, kind of the implications that you were just uh, talking about and drawing on. 
I think that a theist could affirm that God is a necessary existing being, and they could also mm -hmm. affirm. Um, I, I think that they have options. So you could be, you could think that God is a necessary existing being, and you could hold to a B theory of time. You could be um, think that God is. You could think that God is a necessary being, that a B theory of time is true, and that God knows all the future things. You could hold to a necessary, God's a necessary being, a B theory of time is true. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that he doesn't know all the things in the future, that would be an open theist thing. I actually think that's a harder position. Um, but you could be, maybe, yeah, um, you could be a, you could think that God's a necessary being, and that he knows all future things but that a B theory of time is false. So there's a lot of people, so like lots of theologians think that God has propositional knowledge about what's going to happen, but those mm -hmm. things don't actually exist out there yet. Maybe um, God just knows them because he just knows us all so well or you know, whatever. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, you, there's, there's a lot of, so a, 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 a theist committing themselves to thinking that um, God is an unnecessary existing being, that doesn't commit them to a, a view of time that doesn't commit them to a view of divine foreknowledge. Yeah, there's, there's, there's kind of options there. Does that make sense? I think so. I, 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 um, I can see it from like uh, 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 other people's perspectives about God. I mean, I, I guess to, I, I understand that other individuals have their own perspective about what God is capable of. But again, I can't help but bring up the idea that that God is external from all sets of affairs. So uh, 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 I, I, I fully understand what you're saying. Uh, I want to say one more question. Can I ask you one more question before I go? Yeah, go for it, man. Okay, so so um, you believe that this necessary being has a mind, right? Did you say that God has a mind? Yes, I would technically say he has three because I'm a Christian. And so I think that within that one necessary being, um, it is three distinct persons. Okay. And, and, and what, would you, what would you say um, from a philosophical understanding about, uh, or, or, or actually, can you give me a philosophical argument that would, um, that would, uh, uh, point us towards the idea that God must have a mind? Yeah, sure. Um, so within the, um, let me think real quick. So this is in the context of cosmological arguments. So arguments that uh, argue for the existence of God, either because, you know, we have to have this necessary being that grounds all reality, or there is, um, there's this first cause, and this first cause is, you know, causes everything else. So a cosmological argument, can be, both of those things can fall into a cosmological argument. So as far as um, arguments for why either that necessary being has a mind, or whether that um, that that being that first cause has a mind, those arguments are mm -hmm. going to look slightly different depending on if the person who's making the argument is um, using a contingency argument, which is kind of like what we're talking about, about um, mm -hmm. necessity and contingency. So let me give you an example here. Mm -hmm. um, probably one of the most rigorous philosophical arguments for a, for a contingency argument comes from a, mm -hmm. a modern philosopher named Joshua Rasmussen. He's a, he's a pretty prominent Christian philosopher who specialized in this area, and he's written quite a few papers on this. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so he has... Um, he has several, I, I don't know how, like, sometimes people don't like to read academic papers. He has a lot of academic papers about this. If, um, okay, for a second, I thought that was my phone. Um, the, uh, so Joshua Rasmussen has arguments for why that necessary being would need to be a mind. Um, so you can find that in some of his papers. He also has a couple books. Um, he has a book called How Reason Can Lead to God, in which he kind of takes a contingency approach and kind of uses a, a sort of stepping method. Now, uh, from a cosmological perspective, like okay, if we're if we're not talking about um, the this uh, the God as a necessary being, but instead we're kind of catching this out as the first cause. Um, mm -hmm. Andrew Loke is, and, and Loke is spelled L O K E. He's a modern philosopher who's written a couple books on this and has done a couple debates on this. He has a book that's free on Amazon. Um, he's it's called. Let me bring it up. Um, I always forget the name. But yeah, so it's free. It's, um, yeah, so the name of this book 
is the teleological and Kalam cosmological arguments revisited. That's by Andrew Loke, okay. L-O-K-E, and it's on Amazon, and the Kindle version is free. You can you can get it right now. It won't cost you anything. In that book, okay. in that book, um, he has a chapter where he gives a couple arguments for why um, he, he has a chapter where he gives a couple arguments for why that first cause mm -hmm. would be one that has a mind that that is is personal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's. I think Loke's book is probably the one of the best, um, one of the best presentations of these type of arguments that I've seen from a cosmological perspective. The only other mm -hmm. thing I might also reference is William Lane Craig, who you might be familiar with because he's everybody. <laughs> I love him. I hate him. A lot of people know about him. Um, William Lane Craig. He has a couple books on this, and you could actually probably Google some of his debates. So he's done a lot of debates mm -hmm. with um, some atheist philosophers, and he gives mm -hmm. a cosmological argument. And then in giving his cosmological argument in his opening presentation, he usually also includes an argument for why that first cause would be a mind. Um, and I can yeah, give yeah. you a brief sketch. I won't go super in-depth since I, I, could, I think I heard you writing down the names of the book. I'll let you get into the dirty details. But kind of some of the reasons that are offered are – um, if the cause is eternally present, but the effect mm -hmm. came about a finite amount of time ago, someone like, well, Craig and Loke both argue along these lines, is it seems like that imply the only way you can have that is if the cause is an agent who's able to choose to bring about the effect. Um, and so Lo uh, uh, Craig gives the example of uh, the, the cause of water freezing is the temperature being below zero degrees centigrade, right? So like that's um, that's the cause for water freezing. If the temperature has always been below zero degrees centigrade from eternity past, it'd be really weird to say water began to freeze 10 minutes ago or 10 years ago or 10 billion years ago. Like if, if that cause has always been there, why did the effect just begin a finite amount of time ago? And so what guys like Craig and Loke argue, they argue it in different ways, but it's kind of the same concept. They're going to say what you, what you need is you need a cause that's able to bring about the effect, so it's sufficient to bring about the effect, but it's also able to restrain itself from bringing about the effect, and that is a mind, a libertarian agent that can um, choose to bring it about. So Craig uses the kind of, this is a sloppy example, but just, uh, he says, imagine you had a man sitting in a chair from eternity past. That man, being a person, he can choose to stand up. And then so you had a new effect coming from an eternal cause. So that's one of the type of arguments that they might give. Um, but that's just like a 10,000 foot view. You should you should check out Luke's, uh, Luke's work on that. Okay, all right. Um, uh, I, I wanted to say because um, I spoke this through, uh, I spoke this and uh, I, I normally, I, I speak with Muslims, right? And um, the, the best argument I say that I've heard from Muslims when they're talking about a necessary being that must have a mind is they would um, argue from uh, uh, what truth is. Have you ever heard of that argument? The what? Oh, uh, what truth is? What the truth? Argument? Is? Yeah. Have you ever know. heard? Uh, I've uh, heard like transcendental arguments. I'm not a super huge fan of them. But I've heard of them, yeah. Yeah, but they, they say um, uh, uh, truth is a concept. Concepts are mental things. Mental things are grounded in minds, and therefore there must be a necessary mind to ground all truths. Is that what I'm saying? Yeah, I, so I have heard arguments like that. Honestly, I, I would need to think more about that. Off the cuff, I don't find that super persuasive. I, I don't know if I would I would be a fan of that argument, but I would probably need to spend some time more thinking about it. Because I, when I was yeah. Just, yeah, when I was just getting into philosophy, I heard arguments like that. I don't I I, I call them transcendental arguments that either come from the idea of truth or logic or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times, those type of arguments, they utilize assumptions about the existence of abstract objects that I just, I don't, I don't agree with this. I don't think that propositions exist. Like, I don't think the proposition, um, Garb is talking to free naturalists. Like, that's a proposition is true. I don't think that's a thing that exists out somewhere on the other. I don't think the number seven yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of times these arguments, like the one you described, they kind of utilize those concepts. And so 
because I don't because I'm what's called an anti-realist about abstract objects. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm just like I don't want to touch those. You know what I mean? If if someone's like already committed to realism about objects, like those may be mm -hmm. um, those may be really persuasive. And there are atheists who are realists about abstract objects, so maybe those would be more applicable to them. But I just I, I don't like those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. And 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 what's funny about that is when I'm odd, that me as an atheist, when I'm arguing against them, and they say that truth is a concept, and they try to argue that truth only exists within the mind, I would attack them from a physical, from a material, um, from a materialist view, and try to convince them that truth also exists external of your mind so uh, it, it, uh, it's funny how philosophy can work like that because i i uh, on my hand i'm a materialist and i can argue from that point and 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 and, and point to a rational reason as to why is that that a uh, mind is not required to um to establish all states of affairs you know what i'm saying yeah, um, I mean, I think a mind is is, I think a mind is the best explanation for all states of affairs. But I don't argue for that in the way that you had just described about just the the kind of the nature of truth. Um, since you mentioned talking about contingency arguments, I don't know if you know exploring reality here on TikTok or on YouTube. Have you seen if any of his videos or, or Than is is what his name is? Uh, what was his name? He has a YouTube channel and he has a TikTok channel called uh, Exploring Reality. He's a good bud of mine. Um, the reason I bring him up is because he's really into the contingency argument. He's more into the contingency argument than I am. And he's done a couple of... Um, I was actually trying to find them while I was talking to you. He's done a couple of um, longer, argue, longer videos on this argument on his channel. Um, mm -hmm. I was trying to find them. So you might... You might go to like um, exploring reality, or exploring reality on YouTube, and then type in like contingency and what comes up. Um, he also has interviewed jo uh, Joshua Rasmussen, so the guy who I mentioned. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the sunglasses. Uh, the guy who I mentioned earlier, he he's interviewed Joshua Rasmussen. Has had him on the uh, the show. He's also uh, has had uh, Ryan Mullins on a couple times. So he might be, have some stuff mm -hmm. that peruse that you might find interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, one more question before I go. One more question. Yeah. Man, so gonna... so. What what is it what is it about reality that can but oh actually what is it that convinces you most about 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 your about real religion? What is it about reality that convinces you that your religion is true? Yeah, that's a good question. Um so that's something I've thought about a lot. And it's changed over the years. Um so I'll, I'll let me begin by saying this. For most of my life, I hadn't had any type of religious experience. Like sometimes you talk to Christians and they're like, oh, I had this really strong religious experience. And, uh, you know, there are guys on here like Big John Steele and, um, and Than, who I just mentioned, who they appeal to their religious experience. And I'm just like, man, guys, I just don't have that. Like I, I don't have, I didn't have this big like God in the sky, you know experience yeah. that had evidential value to me and so for a significant portion of my christian life what i relied on when i when i thought about this it was like okay why do i believe that there were just certain arguments that i found very convincing and the arguments that i to this day still find really convincing are kalam cosmological arguments kind of like what we've been talking about the need of a first cause and reasons to think that that first cause has a mind so these kind of cosmological arguments and then teleological arguments, so arguments put forth by guys like um, Robin Collins and William Lane Craig, um, who else? Uh, Michael Ray about like, listen, when we look at the the universe, it kind of seems fine tuned for um, for life. So those type of teleological arguments about the nature of the universe, as well as teleological arguments about the nature of biological life you know I like that's not something I actually talk about that much because it gets really complicated with biology and genetics and stuff but I find um, 
I find the nature of life itself and the cell like to be very strong evidence for a designer, although I don't talk about. It. So I would say cosmological mm -hmm. arguments and teleological arguments have been the two things that really have strongly pulled me. But then also, frankly, lately in, in, in recent years, something that's really grown to me as evidence is something that I didn't take really seriously for a long time is I find just testimony from people who have had religious experiences or supernatural experiences. So let me give an, an example. Um, testimony from people who have had serious medical illnesses um, healed as a result of prayer. So I have a buddy, Caleb Jackson, who's writing a book on this at the moment. He's trying to take a bunch of these well-documented cases and, and put them into a book. Um, so instances where you have people who for like 10 or 20 years, they they had a stomach issue where they could not eat. Like literally they had a J-tube. So they had to have a, they had to be fed through a tube in their stomach because there was something physiologically wrong with their stomach. They couldn't eat like properly, like, you mm -hmm. know, um, you're supposed to. And then they had a, they had a, 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 somebody pray for them. And while they had somebody pray for them, they said they felt something. Like they felt some type of like weird energy or electricity. And then like the next day, they, for the first time in like their life, they were able to eat. And all of this has been documented. Like there's medical documentation for all of this. Like, um, uh, what's his name? Joshua Bowen, or not Joshua Bowen. Can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, if you go on YouTube and you type in like uh, Caleb Jackson miracles or something like that, you can find some of Caleb's debates and arguments about it. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so like stuff like that, and there's there's a lot of instances of people having these type of testimony of having having experiences of miracles in this way. But even outside of those miracle claims, just people who report experiencing um, kind of gen uh, supernatural things in general, I think near death experiences um, have become more um, persuasive to me as I studied them deeper. Um, experiences about demonic possession and just uh, uh, experience with the supernatural in general, just kind of more empirical just testimony about the amount of people who have experienced the supernatural. I find that to be um, something that is, is becoming more and more compelling to me. But truthfully, one of the most compelling things to me now is I said for a long time I never had a religious experience. About four years ago, three or four years ago, to my complete and utter surprise, I did. I was um, it was in, it was during COVID, and I had I was at home. I lived with my mother and my brother. We were all kind of cooped up together, and I went out on my patio, and it was night, and um, I was sitting there, and I don't know something was bothering me. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I was I was just I don't know something was bothering me, like kind of existentially, and I I was praying, and I was talking to God. And I'm gonna be honest, I, when I talk, when I pray, a lot of times it's very just casual. It's just like how I talk to you. Um, and I just, I, I just kept on feeling like, man, I just can't articulate what's bothering. I can't articulate what I'm trying to say here. And then so I just kind of was like, all right, God, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Just whatever it is that I need to say, just please help me say it. And then really shortly after that, I had just like, I had, I set up in my chair because I felt this immediate palpable spiritual presence on the porch with me like i had never felt this before like i i would just went from absent-mindedly kind of praying and, and thinking about this to like i set up like i paid attention with what is all going on and the only way i it's not like i saw something it's not like i heard something like through my ears it's just like i just felt a spiritual present that was tangible and the the feeling that i felt like like um like the experience that i had was it was like if you've ever seen a football game and they at the end of the game the players take like the big uh, the big thing of water and they like dump it over the head of the coach and you know just, uh, like, mm -hmm. the coach gets mad and all <laughs> um, it was like that it's like somebody had just dumped that over me but instead of water it felt like somebody had just dumped liquid love all over me it's just like I had just been like washed like it was like love was a palpable substance that I had just been like dipped in. And I, I just, I just, yeah, it was like, it was, a, it was a very enjoyable experience. I liked it, 10 out of 10. Um, <laughs> and I, 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 I don't think I'll ever forget that. And that, that's, that's something that came about very late in my, in my Christian life. And honestly, mm -hmm. I've only had, I think I can say I've had maybe two other instances where I felt that similar type of feeling. And both times I was caught off guard. In fact, one time I, I won't get into the details, but like, I was like, 
it, 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 it led to me doing something I really didn't want to do. It was like, I was kind of felt like, ah, maybe I should do this thing. And I was like, no, it's fine. And then yeah. I felt that and it felt like God was being like, go do that. And I was like, all right, fine. It was like instantly, I was like, I can't argue with this. I have to go do it. So it's kind of like, the reason I mentioned this is because since I've had those experiences now, um, it's not just the intellectual things that I, I mentioned I, that kind of kept me in the faith originally. Now it's like these intellectual things and then also just like I can reflect and, and sometimes I do this because you know sometimes I get I get down and um, I mean I, I struggle with a lot of depression in my life I'm not shy about that I think we need to be more open about mental health issues I have a lot of depression a lot of things like and when I doubt things sometimes when I'm in a stump I can recall my memory I'm really confident in what I felt there like I, I, I remember that and I remember how that felt um, and so yeah so I, I kind of gave a long rambling answer to your to your question there but yeah Oh, oh no, you're fine. I enjoyed hearing that because I want to. I want to mention this because I'm a. I'm a. Um, I'm a Native American, and uh, before like seven years ago, I I I, I believe you know in, in in all sorts of stuff. I I I I've I've went into um ceremonies and and the the one the prayer songs right. There was the prayer songs. And I would, I would get that same feeling as you're getting. I would have that same feeling within me. And at that time, I would, I would be more, it, it, would, it would strengthen my confidence on how to, my, uh, what I, how it convinced me more into what I believed at that current time. Is that what I'm saying? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, so, so, it, I, I, I can definitely see where they're coming from, and uh, I say, even even if I ask a Muslim, you know, they 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 say, they say this exact same thing as you say them to, the like if uh, uh, um, uh, I, I submit to Allah and and Muhammad, and I get these feelings that 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 are overwhelming, and I, I so I fully understand where they're coming from, and. You have these um, feelings that strengthen your faith and your belief, and I, I definitely respect that. And um, I, 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 do, I, I do want to thank you so for allowing me to speak up here. Yeah, dude, I'm glad you came on. This is a really good conversation. I've been on here for like two hours, and I was thinking that when you came up, I was like, I'll probably, let, I'll probably have this guy be the last guy that I can't come on. And I'm really glad you did, dude. I'm really glad that we could end on a chill note. I don't know if you were here when I started this stream. The first guy I had was like very yelly, and so this was just <laughs> really calm. And I've gotten, to, I've gotten to talk philosophy with some uh, cool people, and I'm really glad you came up. Anytime you see me uh, on live, uh, please feel free to uh, invite to come on. Yeah, man. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and zip off now. Thanks, dude. I appreciate it. God bless. Um, right. Okay, I, yeah, I've uh, for all everybody else here, I've been on for a couple hours now. My phone is close to dying. I desperately need to pee. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop off. I appreciate everybody coming and hanging out. For the people who uh, hopped up on live and chatted with me, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, maybe, fan. Maybe. Uh, I just recommend you weren't here. I th well, I don't know if you were here when I recommended that uh, he go check out your channel. I said fans done some stuff on contingency argument. Go check him out. Um, yeah, let me let me get off this and then see if I have to go somewhere tonight. Anyway, sorry. Uh, that's that's for me and Than having a private conversation. Uh, anyways, yeah. The uh, you guys all take care. God bless. Uh, thanks for coming up and chatting. See if I can figure out this. <laughs>